It's time for the holiday help desk here on Studio Live today. Should we do it? Let's do it. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Holiday Help Desk here on Studio Live today. We've been doing this for, well, one year. We did it last year and it was so much fun. I thought, let's go ahead and do it again this year. We just get together for a bit of a casual time. I know a lot of the time we're on a, a tight time frame and we're trying to get things done and I'm trying to get through things and we're trying to do segments and we're doing all the things. This time around, uh, it, it is all about you. It's about your questions. I've got a bunch of sort of backup questions that I've got going on. I've got camera two up here in case we need to show anything and display anything. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're just going to settle back and relax for a little while. If you do have any questions, all you need to do if you're here live is drop the word question at the start of your comment. That'll mean that when I jump here into the comments in StreamYard, which is what I use for streaming, feel free to ask me more questions about streaming as we go. If uh, if you've got a question yet, just throw a question in. It just means I can find it and uh, answer your questions. And uh, we are brought to you here today uh, by uh, by me. So uh, we're not sponsored here today. But uh, uh, if you are a uh, supporter of the channel or you want to dive in a little bit deeper on Studio Live today or you want to join a smaller, tight-knit community, uh, Patreon is the way to go. If you go to studiolivetoday.com slash Patreon, uh, you'll go not to here because I haven't shared my screen yet. You'll go <laughs> you'll go and check out over here where we'll bring up this screen and uh, you'll be able to get access to all of the posts. So we do, uh, we do live shows, we have chats in there, uh, there's some exclusive extras and bits and pieces and some early looks at some of the videos. Uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, yeah, you could say, hey, it's the same stuff you got on your YouTube channel except there's a little bit extra there as well and uh, I think the best part is you, if you've got questions and you want to sort of ask me something specific that's the best way to do it because as I say to my wonderful patrons who support me over there for as little as one dollar per month um, every inbox that I check uh, I do try to get to all of my different inboxes but uh, to be honest I have them on like email and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and uh, LinkedIn people people uh, message me a bunch of places which is great I'm not complaining about that but I don't always get to everything every day the first thing that i check pretty much every day is the patreon inbox so it just gives you an opportunity to do that and we've got 78 wonderful folks there so um what are we we're three days from the end of the year do we dare try and say let's get 100 patrons by the end of the year maybe if you if you join I'll, I'll give you a shout out if you join if you become a patron right here during the show i'll give you a shout and uh, say good day and say thank you we'll be we'll be like a twitch stream we'll be like yo yo fam uh let's uh let's get a uh, let's get a what do they call them a, a, a rant train going no i don't know i don't i know nothing about uh, twitch <laughs> uh let's dive in and say good day to folks because we've already got the questions starting to roll in and i don't want to get behind whenever i do these shows i usually start running way behind and then uh, I, I never quite catch up so get day to the folks we've got dave fox here we've got mark bro uh kenneth is here g'day to you bass car tech is here hello to you uh, thomas christ if i didn't say hello to you desolate morning uh merry christmas happy new year all of that holiday festive stuff to anyone who's here john frank songs g'day to you i hope you are doing well my friend let's get on with the uh, first question shall we Adam Gehring, I'm horrible with timing. I'm practicing, but I've got some good tracks. Is it okay to quantize the tracks to fix the timing or should I keep plugging away until my timing is perfect? What a great question and what a great way to start us off here in uh, in this uh, holiday help desk for 2021-22 because timing is probably one of the most underrated but important parts of music. Where I, I do a show every week, as many of you know, called Your Music Live. And I play a lot of music on Your Music Live. And the number one thing that I pick up that I give feedback on, look, I don't always do it live on the show. Sometimes I'll just send a subtle email and say, hey, you probably need to work on your timing. Because in music, there is something called being in the pocket, being right in, in the groove, in the pocket, on the beat, on the mark, whatever you want to call it. And it usually comes from playing with bands. It usually comes from playing with drummers and bass players and guitarists and singers and keyboard players and having to find that way to gel together. Now, the challenge we have is a lot of folks that are playing now either have never played in a band with other players or haven't done it in a really long time. And as nice as our virtual drummers are and as nice as it is to use virtual instruments and to record one by one, it's really hard to get in and find that groove when you're only playing by yourself because you're really trying to get into a groove with something that might just be a virtual instrument. So 
I say that all that to say, yeah, quantization is totally cool. And if you're using virtual instru instruments and you want to quantize them, uh, totally 100% cool, especially if it's your bass or your drum. Because the key to, especially if rock music and that sort of thing, the key to getting in the zone is your kick drum or your bass drum and your bass guitar, because they are the engine rooms. They are what's usually driving the beat along. And when a song doesn't sound right is when the melody instruments or the harmony instruments, so your top end, doesn't align with your bottom end. And this can sound, whenever you hear a sound that's not quite right, it's usually because someone's hit a guitar chord and the bass player is like just in before that or just in after that. Or the kick drum is not right. The kick drum's beautifully right on that one beat because you've quantized it. And then your guitar just comes in just that couple of microseconds too late. And it really can ruin. A perfectly good song can kind of become sloppy. And whenever you hear that sloppy sound, that's what we're talking about. Um, I'll uh, I'll show you an example. In fact, let's because uh, I've got my uh, I've got my setup here, so I can actually show my screen. So if we bring if we bring this up here and we go down to here, <laughs> actually that's going to be weird. I'll I'll take away camera two just for a moment. See a camera two. We'll bring that back in a moment, and we'll uh, we'll do this so that I can come down and put myself there. There we go. That's going to be better. I'll just hide your question for the time being. So the song that you heard there at the start is a song of mine called Imagination. So imagination, I'll type it in over here, imagination, and load it up here. No, don't do that. Load it up here on my iPad. And this is one where there's a particular spot in here. I thought I'd show my flaws here. A particular spot in here where I'm really not in the pocket. So the good thing about this is I'm using, um, I'm using a bass groove, I'm using a virtual drummer, and I'm using loops. So the actual groove here, my only challenge was getting my pianos and keys to sit in the pocket here, which I think I did a pretty good job at in these parts. So well, let's just take a listen to the start that you heard there. So you hear how every time it's hitting on there, it's bringing in and all the notes are nicely lined up there. Now, when I come in here and start doing my vocals, uh, it sounds okay until it gets to a particular part. So we'll, uh, we'll bring my vocals in here. So it's in this second verse here. Nation's warring, everything is burning. Kind of surprised that the world keeps turning. Mother nature is kicking our ass and never seem to learn the lessons of our past. Instead of happiness, we're chasing money. And I've so you can hear there that like some of the bits are, are syncopated, but some of the bits are right there on the beat. So th there is a part here in a moment here where I float it off and you'll hear it and it will stick out. If you haven't heard it before, it'll stick out like a sore thumb. I'll play it, see if you can identify it. And I think that's uh, kind of funny. Not hard to use an indicator to tell us your direction or even estimate the weight. Did you hear how behind I was there? That's because I'm a middle-aged dude and I don't have a whole lot of flow. But you could hear that I'm just behind the beat. I'll play it again for you just so that you can hear it, uh, hear that exact part. And just listen to this again. Not hard to use an indicator to tell us your direction or even if to make the waste. So it wasn't tight. I wasn't hitting right on the beat. I wasn't right on the spot where I needed to be. So I should have re-recorded that part. Why didn't I? That's anyone's guess. I was in a rush. I wanted to get it done. I wanted to finish the project. Who knows? But we didn't get it done at the time. Should have done that. Should have spent the extra time making it better. But that's kind of the, the, the key to that. And to be honest, to, to come right back around and answer your question, Adam, it's about practice. It's about practice makes progress. Uh, practice doesn't make perfect. People think practice makes perfect. It makes progress. So the more time you spend really just listening to music, listen to really good music, listen to funk music and listen to rap music and R&B and hip hop and rock music and just listen for that pocket because you'll hear people that are right there in the pocket, but it can be a challenge to get there. I've done the opposite of what I said I would do and uh, spent a lot of time on one question. So <laughs> we'll better move on. Uh, do you look forward to all the smart ass questions? I look forward to them the most, Kurt, the most of all. The smart artery, the better. Uh, what are the best inexpensive online mastering option? So I haven't used a heap of the online mastering options to be super, super uh, honest. Uh, to be honest, these days, mastering, it's not simple, but it is a lot easier than it kind of ever has been. And I know mastering engineers are probably going to be angry at me when I say things like that. But I think that you can actually master your own music using things like Final Touch, uh, which is an iOS app, just using GarageBand and a master track, so using a limiter and some EQ. So I think there's actually good ways to actually master your own music. If you want the an easy and effective way to just throw it up there, 
the, if, if you're in the iOS world, there's something called Audio Master Pro, which is a fabulous app that requires virtually no... I actually mastered that song you just heard there. Uh, I, I mastered in Audio Master Pro because it's just a really simple setup. I'll show you it over here. Uh, it wants me to rate it, but we're not going to rate it right now. We'll come over here. So w w Audio Master Pro, you literally just put your track in here and none of these dials actually do anything. You just dial in your genre and then tell it how extreme to master it, and that's literally it. And then you set your you set your overall level down the bottom here. So it's a really easy way to get mastering. Now, in terms of what I would use and what I've used in the past and, and what other people have recommended, it seems to come back to Lander. Lander seems to be the most popular one. That's this one here. And look, because everything's on sale right now, 30% off their yearly plans. If, you, if you're going to uh, be mastering a whole lot of music, it's probably a good idea to get something like Lander uh, yearly plan. If you pay by, because you can actually pay per song. Now, here's the deal. There's no, none that I've found that are still available. There used to be one called Schnalls. It's not available anymore. There's no mastering uh, platforms that are free and are really good. They'll almost always have limitations. And the limitations are usually, so for something like Lander, if we could have come through here and we try to we try to come in, oh, see, it's making it hard. It just, it just wants us to get this deal. It's put this landing page in front of us and now I can't seem to get through. Am I just going to have to go and get the deal? <laughs> I just had. I, I sorry. I had to sign up to Lander just so that I can, um, so that I can actually get this one deal. No, come on. Oh, see, it's taking a long time. It wants to. No, uh, it's not going to let me go. It, it almost let me go into like the pricing section there, and then it didn't. So uh, I'm not going to go in there. But let's just say that it does cost you a little bit to master each song. If anyone else has any other suggestions, eMastered is another one I know folks use uh, that they dig. But Land is probably the best balance uh, for it. And you can get a, a free uh, MP3 version, like a 320 kilobit MP3 version uh, to start with if you want to. Uh, yeah, come on, Dave Fox. Thank you. Yeah, let's get let's let's go to 100. It's only 22 people. There's 26 people in the chat right now. <laughs> Most of you are actually already patrons, and I do appreciate you. Thank you. You rock. Uh, question: Is there a way to turn audio into MIDI? Another really good question, and funnily enough, that was on my list, uh, Desolate Morning, to talk about today, because the short answer is no, but the longer answer is kinda. And there are apps and there are different things. So, and you can even go into, there's, there's online things. In fact, we, we should probably try something. Let, let's see if we can live, if anyone's got any, uh, any tips on this. But there are, uh, there are a bunch of things that we have here. Oh, look, we've got the first, the first result when I go audio to MIDI is a Fiverr thing. Someone wants to be able to, uh, to for you to pay them to do that. Uh, so you can do it in a audio to MIDI in Ableton Live, apparently. So there you go. Ableton Live has a function to extract MIDI from audio. That's pretty cool. I've never used that. There's the online audio to MIDI converter at conversion tool. Uh, there's about FL Studio, how to do it. Uh, what if we did audio to MIDI in GarageBand? Let's just see this and see if there's anyone in this community that has a uh, uh, has something for this. How to transcribe music, audio and MIDI to transcribe music in the score editor. Well, that's a bit different than what we want. Convert audio to MIDI and MIDI to audio, creating tracks. Yeah. So maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll explore that. I had to record audio and MIDI at the same time, our man Patrick. But um, so there's not there's other apps by the way as well, like MIDI Guitar 2, which is um, an, an app on iOS. I've not used it. Uh, I know Jade Star has explored it, and other folks have looked at it in the past. So that may be one to look at if you're a guitarist and you want to convert to MIDI. But these are the sort of things where it's great to do these shows because I'll throw this out here now and say, hey. Anyone watching live, if you've got an idea of audio to MIDI converters that you've used that have been successful, then let us know. Because uh, it is cool. It, it's a good idea to uh, to, to do that. Uh, hello, DJ Normal Norman. G'day to Gregory O'Sullivan. Thanks for dropping in on by. Uh, the Justin Duke Project question. I use a Presonus Audio Box i2 as an interface. I really like it and no longer use my Behringer Zenex Q802 USB. Is there a way to incorporate it into my workflow or should I sell it? Really good questions. So uh, let, let's jump over. And this is a good segue to tell you that if you are in the market for some gear, you can go here to the Studio Gear Guide at studiolivetoday.com slash gear. I'll show it to you here and this will jump us over to the places where I normally go to uh, shop for gear. So uh, the Studio Gear Guide here, I've got my mobile set up. So this is what I use for my iPad and iPhone recordings. And then I've got my desktop set up down here as well. So for me, I actually use a mixer. So, so what our friend here is talking about is an audio interface and a mixer. So the audio interface that I use here on my desktop is uh, this one here, the Steinberg. Where is it? 
<laughs> oh, that's right. I'm using the 2i2 at the moment. So I'm using the Focusrite 2i2 on my Mac, which is why I've got that listed here. I also use the Steinberg uh, UR22C. Uh, but our friend here is using the PreSolness i2, which is basically very similar to the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 or the Steinberg UR22. They're all much of a muchness. There you go. You can see it's almost same price, same functionality, all the same stuff. So very nice, very nice. The audio box uh, have, have come a long way. The, the PreSolness originally were a little bit on the cheap side. Uh, but these days, they're, they're actually quite good. And what our friend's saying is they've also got the Behringer, and I think it was the Q802 that you were talking about, not the A802, the Q802. Oh, oh there's an A800. Uh, Behringer, Behringer. Please search for Behringer, Q802. Uh, let's find the Behringer. So Behringer Q82, so this is a USB mixer. So what would you use a mixer for? Well, mixer, you can bring in multiple sources. So you can plug in a couple of microphones, you can plug in some line inputs here if you've got keyboards or you've got other amplifiers that you want to send out here. And the Q802 has, uh, well, it's got six there, I think it's got eight total channels that you can bring in there. Uh, yeah, I think this one's a channel as well. So this, and it also is a USB interface. So you can use this as a USB interface. Now the preamps on there, as you can probably tell for $79, uh, well, that's, that's really cheap at the moment by the way they're usually they're never 179 but they're usually about 120 or so uh, but 79 is a good price for that uh, so the question is can we use this well sort of uh, if you're doing live applications so if you're performing live or you're doing live streaming a mixer is a godsend uh, if we switch over here to my to my view here and we bring we bring a second camera in here so this is my setup here right so i've got up here I've got my start, the uh, the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 that I use on my Mac that you can see there, but I also use this, the Zoom Live Track L8, because this is my mixer where I can plug in my sources. So I've got you know stereo channel in here for my uh, my iPad that I've got over here that's running around there through there. It's actually running through a a Steinberg UI22C under there. So having a mixer is great for doing stuff exactly like this and live performances. So if you wanted to start doing some live performances or some streaming or recording some videos for YouTube, that's where the mixer is going to come in handy. You can also go from, uh, I'll just remove, I'll bring this one back and add this one back in. You can also go from a mixer into an audio interface. So let's just say that you were recording something live and you wanted to just record a couple of mics and, and play along with a track. You can send the outputs. See how this has got a main out? This has got a TRS output. You can grab those and send the TRS output, your two stereo channels, and you can throw those into the inputs. If we come back, hopefully if we just go back and back and back, it'll take us back to that Presonus, uh, not that one. Keep going. So you can actually throw these. So these work, see how it's got mic and line there? These work as both mic inputs and line level inputs. So there, that's easy to see. So it's got mic, line, slash instrument. So what you can actually do is use this as a stereo input. So put TRS into there, and then you're recording a stereo signal into your audio interface. So that's a couple of things. Look, if all you're doing is, uh, coming back to the question, if all of your, you're doing is actually just um, recording your own self and you're doing multi-track recording where you're doing track by track by track, then you probably don't need a mixer. But if you're ever doing anything live application or you want to record multiple things and mix them down at once, live and on the fly, that's where a mixer can come in handy. But good question. Thank you for asking. We are way behind. Uh, there is an app uh, for that called A2M. I've done a show on it. It isn't perfect. And that's the case with, and we're, this is back to the uh, audio to MIDI. I've, I've seen a few people try it. It's never perfect. And the question you've got to ask yourself at the end of the day is, why do you want to go audio to MIDI? Uh, the, a better option is to use a MIDI keyboard and actually play in a part or, uh, or find another way to get it in there. MIDI guitar too, same with guitar. Nothing that I've found seems to work really well. And uh, others may have other experience. But remember... MIDI and audio are both completely different, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, actually, because I've got a, I've got another question and a whole segment on on that one that we will get to eventually. Uh, da, 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 da. And there's a link. There's the app, and there's a link to Jade's video on it, which is all good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we all have those sloppy moments. Sounds sounds a bit weird. We all have moments where we're not right in the grid, right on the beat, right in the in the zone. Again, I love saying to people, listen to music and listen to like real jazz music is great for, for people that are right in the pocket and funk music and anything with like some cool bass and kick drum that's really driving. Listen to Queen, Queen music. Freddie Mercury was always in the pocket. If you sit down and listen to two hours of Queen and then you sit down and play or sing or do what you're doing, I reckon you'll actually be more in the pocket than you were before. 
Uh, thank you, Rothstein. Thank you for dropping on by. Uh, yeah, I do love me. I do love me some garage band for sure. Uh, scrolling on down. Hello to Dr. Zorders. Oh, we have to do this. Dr. Zorders. I hope you and all the Zorders interns are doing well. Uh, let's see. Uh, is Pete Moore Slim Shady or Chris Cross? Hmm. Uh, if we're talking about the, the 90s group, Chris, Cro Chris Cross, who'll make you jump, jump, and Daddy Mac will make you jump, jump. I actually, I had a weird Eminem phase in the uh, in the early 2000s where I was, you know, angry 20-something white man and somehow thought that uh, listening to, to Eminem, I actually quite liked uh, the album The Eminem Show. Uh, I didn't really like the skits in between. I wasn't big on the whole violence aspect of it and the shock side of it. But in terms of some actually really good melodies and really good beats, yeah, I actually kind of rate it. Criss Cross were a bit of a novelty act and uh, I didn't mind that. Uh, what is the best way to master? So yeah, uh, g'day Ross, we just talked about that a bit before. I showed uh, Lander before. Uh, I haven't used the Lander, I haven't got the Lander plan, which is where you can get the full mastering, but try out Lander. I'm pretty sure you can still do like one or two tracks per month for free as an MP3 and just see if you like the sound of them. It's okay. I, I, I don't hate it, but I don't love it. And to be honest, uh, I showed a couple of that. If you're on iOS, I showed a couple of apps before, like Audio Master Pro. Uh, Final Touch is a great mastering app on iOS. And even if you're on a, a desktop, um, so Mike over at Creative Source has got some great videos on mastering in Cakewalk, uh, which is a free, uh, Cakewalk by BandLab is a free uh, DAW. And on Mac, uh, even GarageBand. Like GarageBand has a master track and it's got some actual decent sort of limiting. Because remember, your mastering doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be an intimate sort of reinventing the wheel kind of science. It can be as simple as making sure that your track is uh, radio ready or streaming ready. And really a lot of that is just about making sure that you have a competitive volume, but you're still maintaining a decent dynamic range. You're not completely crushing it and you're making a sausage waveform we've talked about in the past, but you're also get making it competitive because if you don't master a song the risk is that you, you you're not peaking you're not hitting up near zero db and you've got too many low sections and if you're playing your song and then someone else's song it's going to sound out of whack so yeah i i think that's the, the the easiest answer for that but there's a heap of videos here on the channel that i have done i've i've tried mastering in every different way so i've tried lander uh, if we go pete johns l-a-n-d-r which i only realized uh, later was lander was l and r <laughs> So that's where Lander came from. Uh, so if you search my name, Pete John's Lander, I've got like a 15 minute video where I go through Lander. So you can check that one out after the show if you like. And if you go Pete John's and Mastering, there's, uh, in fact, if you go Mastering Playlist, I think this will give you the complete playlist of all of my mastering videos. And I'm, I'm by no means an expert. There you go. Uh, no, that's not it. All right, so it hasn't found it, but, but you've got a bunch of here. So there's that Audio Master Pro. Uh, there's two of my favorite apps, Grand Finale and Final Touch. What's the difference between the two of those? W my actual mastering, I've got an eight-part uh, mastering and Final Touch uh, complete guide. So th there's a bunch of stuff there that you can check out right here on the channel if you want to learn a little more about mastering. Yeah, and if you're using Cubasis, uh, yeah, the master strip in Cubasis is actually really good. <clears throat> uh, Thomas Christ, was Santa good to you this year? Got anything cool for Christmas? Um, I, I mean, I did. Um, it, it might not sound very glamorous, but I got new bed sheets. And I don't know about you guys, but I love myself some new bed sheets and some new quilt covers. Like, there's nothing better than having fresh, like, brand new uh, sheets that you, 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 know, you make your bed and you just get in that first night. Anyway, uh, that's an old man thing. Uh, and I got a nice bottle of uh, Canadian Club aged whiskey. And, uh, sorry, aged rye, is it? Canadian Club? Rye? Rye whiskey? Um, and, yeah, so that... that, that what well, well, I joked at that I'm like because uh, I we don't we don't do a lot in the way of presents. It's all about the kids for Christmas these days because I got uh, two young kids. But um, yeah, I joked to my wife. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I got uh, I got new sheets and I got a bottle of scotch so I can uh, get uh, absolutely s faced and then uh, pass out in some really comfortable sheets and go with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, d I didn't really go that. Didn't didn't get any sort of thing musical or anything. Um, I've, I've Let's be honest, I've, I've got a lot of gear this year. I've spent quite a bit and, uh, and also been thankful enough to be uh, to have given a bunch of stuff by some different companies. So uh, I'm not lacking for gear. New guitar is always on the agenda and on the horizon, but uh, at this point in time, yeah, not much. But what about you folks? Anyone get anything cool and musical for lunch? Uh, for lunch. For lunch. Can you tell I'm hungry? It's like, a, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. What did you get for lunch? Uh, yes, and I hear the Jade Star online service works well. Yeah, so if, you, if you're looking for mastering, uh, Jade Star... 
I'm not sure you understand anything, Siri. Uh, Jade Star on her Patreon, and Jade, feel free to chuck a link to your Patreon there. Let's just just join. If you've got yeah, two bucks, two bucks a month, a dollar a month for Jade, dollar a month for me, and you can join two pretty cool Patreon communities, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, but Jade does a show every week where she masters folks' music pretty much for free. I mean, yeah, you got to pay a dollar a month, but that's a pretty good deal. Uh, she uses the Lurson Mastering Console generally uh, to do the mastering there, and you'll see if you see her do some of the the mastering, it's um. It, it's pretty, it's pretty, not easy, but it's not as hard as people think. You just need to listen to it and you just need to listen to it and go, because the, the, the key thing with mastering is do no harm. So when you're mastering a song, you really have to make sure you keep coming back because you should have mixed that song. Like you should have done the record, the creating recording start, side of it and mixing. You should have that sounding exactly how you want it before you go to mastering. Just like you can't fix it in the mix, you definitely can't fix it in the master. And I know from, from Jade, from her experience and from what I've done, when people have sent me things to master, it, it, it's a bit awkward, but sometimes I simply have to say, you need to go back and remix this. Uh, you need to change this because you can do certain things with EQ. But remember, mastering, you're just looking at the whole thing. You're not going into individual tracks. You've just got a single stereo wave file and you're mastering just based on your EQ, your limiting, your compression, and that's about it. So there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room to go there. <clears throat> um, is BandLab's online mastering not good? It's still free as far as I know. Yeah, so now, look, this is something that I've never actually played with. And maybe this is this is a good thing because we um, we do these shows and I get a whole bunch of, uh, of really cool uh, ideas from you folks. So BandLab Instant Free Mastering says it is the best online mastering. Your music, your sound, import your tracks, uh, include Wave MP3. Maybe we need to, maybe we should try this. And look, we've got Universal, Fire, Clarity, and Tape. Huh, which online settings? Set? So maybe this is something that I need to do, maybe with world-class artists and engineers. Okay, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this out. Maybe again, I'll, I'll leave this tab open and depending on timing, if we come back, Chris, we'll, uh, we'll try BandLab mastering live here on the show, not to put Jade and her Patreon out of a job or, or myself or mastering engineers. But yeah, I, I honestly haven't tried it and other people have said that it's pretty good. So we'll, we'll leave that tab open. We'll return to it later in the show and check it out for sure. I need some new sound packs on my garage band. Well, we did a show uh, recently. We got 13 of them this year, Ross. So go to your sound library and garage band and check them out. They're, uh, they're cool. Uh, the cheapest thing is watching Pete John's tutorials on mastering. And then if you liked it, donate. To yeah, exactly. Spot on. Uh, yeah. And if you do, by the way, you can, down in the description, if you're not a Patreon person, I understand a lot of people don't like the, the monthly subscription thing. I dig it. I'm not huge on that for a lot of things. I am patrons of a few places, but not a heap. Uh, so if you do want to do one-off donations, super chat here on YouTube, or of course you can uh, you can donate directly via PayPal. There are links down below and uh, all donations are never expected, but always appreciated. Has GarageBand got auto-tune? I can't find any vocal tuning packs. It sure does. Uh, it's actually called pitch control in GarageBand or pitch correction or uh, tuning control. It's, it's got a bunch of different names, but the best source, in my opinion, is to I did a video on this one because uh, auto tune kind of splits the splits the field when it comes to this. Um, but I did this video here, uh, auto tune, but it's subtle. So effective auto tune for vocals in garage bands. A pitch control, so you can see there, it's on the radio ready and the lead vocals presets in garage band. I'll show you that in a moment if you like. But this is the best video to watch uh, if you if you want to check it out. So just search Pete Johns and auto tune in your YouTube search engine and click that one. It's only a seven minute watch. It'll show you how to access it. It'll show you how to use it. And most importantly, how to not add it to your entire vocal track. So what I actually do with auto-tune, and I showed it in this one, but what I actually do with auto-tune is I split my vocal. So if we come back over here, I'll just show you a really quick example of what I do here. If we jump back over to GarageBand and we go to this one, so what I would actually do if I was doing auto-tune on this, and you can see I've kind of done it here with some of these. I've got some, some splits between these two. So we've got sort of two vocals here, and let's just say that this was my lead vocal instead. It's this one here. How it is I got here, and if I'm going under all the complications of my... In this case, it's just so that I can switch it from the left to the right and back to the left. But what I could actually do is if this was all one vocal track, I could split off chunks of it and then add auto-tune to just that chunk. So if you come in here, you can go into your vocal setting here and see I've got pitch control there. You can just turn that up. I usually leave it off. I don't, I'm not a huge fan of auto-tune. I don't use it as an effect, but it can be good at just sort of correcting some of those words. But if you've only got maybe one or two phrases that need auto-tune, don't stick auto-tune on your whole uh, song and ruin your whole vocal take. Just split out the parts that need it and add it just to those parts here in GarageBand. It is a 
really cool way to make sure that you are helping yourself out because <laughs> let's be honest, we can't all hit every note, uh, but at the same time, you are giving, uh, you're, uh, you're not auto-tuning everything. <clears throat> I work with singers that need auto-tune. Yeah, and, and look, not, I don't want to get into a big debate about auto-tune because some people like it, some people hate it, some people like me uh, think it's just a, a tool like anything else. It's just a, it's a tool that you have in your toolkit and you use it when you need to use it. I would argue that if a singer always needs a lot of auto-tune, what they actually need is singing lessons. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but instead of it's, it's a bit like you're mixing. If if you are if you have a crappy guitar tone, don't just keep having a crappy guitar tone and then try and mix it with all the plugins to make it sound half decent. Sculpt your guitar tone up front. Play around with your amp settings. Play around with your guitar settings. Like get your guitar sound as good as you can, and then tweak it and enhance it. If you've got it's the old you know garbage in garbage out thing. If you if you if it's not there, it's not there. I'm not saying you can't do it, but yeah, I would I would focus on a good performance, and then you might need a whole lot in the way of uh, in the way of correction. Hello, Jerry Gomes. Thank you. There. Uh, yes, auto tune is there, but it's the pitch shift. Absolutely, exactly. All right. Uh, just scrolling down. So once again, if you are if you are just here and you do have questions, the easiest way. Uh, and yes, as as Ross says, this is a very good positive chat. We have amazing moderators, and we have a fabulous community here. So welcome to the community, Ross. Hang around. Hope you uh, hope you join in and uh, hope you enjoy hanging out with us here. Uh, and if you are new like Ross, or if you're an old hat like Jade and Tom and Jerry and all the folks and Mark and everyone that we've got here, if you've got a question, just throw the word question in front and uh, we will... I love these shows because they're pretty casual and laid back and we just go from topic to topic. We jump around. You folks help answer the questions. I tell you what I know and uh, we all discover and learn stuff because nobody knows everything. We're all just a work in progress after all. <laughs> uh, Chris says, I had a Behringer Xenix. I'm glad it's gone. Look, Behringer, again, we could do a whole show on just on uh, on Behringer, but it's it, Behringer stuff is okay. If you get the Behringer stuff that has the Xenix preamps, uh, then it, it, it's not too bad. The really cheap uh, Behringer's are not great, uh, but yeah, look, there's better stuff out there. There's also worse stuff out there. Um, yeah, Scarlet is good, exactly. I like my, I like my Scarlet. I like my uh, Steinbergs. Uh, yeah, 16-bit. You do have to be careful. Uh, so and it's a good point that Mark makes here. When you are shopping around for an audio interface, if it doesn't tell you that it's 24-bit audio, it's probably 16-bit audio. And what's the difference? So let's have a quick quick chat here about 24-bit versus 16-bit since, uh, since Mark has raised it here. So let's jump back over to the gear guide, studiolivetoday.com slash gear. And uh, if we come in here and we'll go into something like uh, the, the, the focus, right? actually we'll go to one of the other audio interfaces that I use, which is the uh, Steinberg UR22C. Let's go in here to, uh, we'll go over to Amazon this time, see if they have it in stock over at Amazon. Uh, they don't. <laughs> but what you'll notice is, you see how about this item it says industry leading converters providing up to 32 bit 192 kilohertz audio now 32 bits overkill as long as you got 24 bit you're fine but hey future proof yourself and 192 kilohertz audio i mean i use 44.1 i know a lot of people use 48 kilohertz or 4 or 96 or 192 it really doesn't matter but as long as you got at least 24 bit and uh, 44.1, that's generally enough. But the the problem is if you go for something like the Behringer, like a lot of folks do this when they start out, they get the Behringer UM2. Now, I'm not going to just sit here and bag on Behringer. If, if you've only got $44 to spend on an audio interface, it's better than nothing. It's better than just trying to plug in using like a, an adapter cable. You still get a preamp, you still get a, a line input, you still get the ability to record. But if you come down here, you'll notice that when it doesn't tell you, see how it just says uh, audio Audio file, which I think is a bit of a laugh. Audio file, 48 kilohertz resolution for pro pro professional quality recording, maximum sampling rate, 48. So the, the, the Steinberg had a 192, this has 48. But if it doesn't mention the bit rate, it, it, it's like it's not going to mention it if it's not good. So anything that doesn't tell you that it's 24-bit or 32-bit means it's a 16-bit interface. And that just means that you're not getting as much dynamic range, you're not getting as much clarity into your recordings. You're going to get more noise, more signal-to-noise, ratio and you're not going to get that same clarity you would with 24-bit audio we have 24-bit audio in all of our software now so in 2021 and 2022 you kind of want to buy yourself hardware that has a 24-bit processor 24-bit uh, preamp so that your converters can convert audio up to 24-bit uh, Doctor's Orders, if you go down the Lander route, they will eventually put their prices up. Yeah, and you would have seen when I showed Lander before, there was that introductory price and they're a subscription model and they want to get you into the, all the extras and all the add-ons and all the bells and whistles. 
So yeah, I, I, I don't love that sort of stuff. And I think the other thing about mastering yourself, before you go down the land, lander route, try mastering. Just, just try it because you can do it in anything. All you need to do is export your song as a stereo WAV file, full quality stereo WAV file, import it back into anything, into GarageBand, into Logic, into Audacity. You can do it in anything and then just play around with it. Just try different things. Try EQ, try some compression, some multi-band compression, a limiter, look, reverb. I don't really use reverb in mastering. Some people do. I, I don't think it's the right place. So yeah, play around with it, experiment, turn everything up to 11, see what happens because you'll learn a lot about what you should and shouldn't do. And then if you do want to then go and use a free service or get someone else to do it, you'll at least know what they're doing. You'll know that it's not this magic secret source. It's actually just common sense. It's you want your sound to have enough dynamic range so that you can hear the difference between the loud and the quiet bits, but you also want it to be at a competitive level so that it can be similar to other music that you're hearing out there. <laughs> that Zoom gives me gas. Yeah, look, I do love my Zoom. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It, it, it took me a while to get used to the Zoom, but now it's kind of like an extension. You can see it just sits here by my left hand, and it's an extension of my hand because when I want to jump over here and uh, play something on the iPad, I know I just pull up these faders on channels five and six. I've got my guitar permanently into channel two, so uh, I can always have my acoustic guitar ready to go there. My mic's here in channel one, and I've got a couple of channels here free if I want to add in other things. So when I've got a guest on, when Georgie's coming on, we can get another mic going on. We've got instant access to some nice reverb, if I just want to do that, and you can control all the effects there. It records separately as well. Um, so yeah, it, it just kind of does everything. It's a mixer. It's an audio interface. It's a standalone recorder. It doesn't even need a computer. You can literally just plug this, plug into this thing on the go and uh, run it off batteries, and it'll record to an SD card. It's, it's pretty freaking amazing, if I do say so myself. Uh, and look, I'm not in any way sponsored by Zoom. Uh, Hi, Zoom. <laughs> Feel free to reach out. It's not, it's not through uh, not through lack of wanting. I love Zoom and I think they make good products. But um, yeah, it, it is just a, a, great, uh, a great mixer. And if you're in the market for a mixer, it's pretty good value. Pretty good value. So uh, do, do, do check it out. And uh, if you've got any questions about it, uh, you can ask them here by doing that, or you can uh, you can hit me up on Patreon or uh, on my email. My email's everywhere, pete at studiolivetoday.com, and I'm pretty good at getting back to you. <laughs> Hope to. Uh, yeah, so Justin, who asked the question about the, the mixer versus the interface, uh, planning on getting back into streaming again. And look, for streaming, a six, I, I used a 16-bit Samson mix pad for years, and no one cared. No one said, oh, you're streaming quality. Because streaming, you can get away with not bad quality audio, but no one's going to really tell the difference between 24-bit and 16-bit. And let's be honest, uh, the YouTube and the, the Twitch and the Facebook compression usually compress it down to, uh, to much worse anyway. So it's, uh, it's not as big a deal when you're streaming. So a mixer for streaming is very, very cool. Uh, vocal audio to MIDI hum beats too. There you go. There's another option. We've got people coming in. Hello, Gino, Therese. Thank you for dropping on. Bye. Uh, Gortiam85 was just looking at the Tascam US1X2HR interface. Anyone use one? I not only don't use one, I have no idea what that is. One of my first interfaces was a Tascam. I used a Tascam US125M, which they almost definitely don't make anymore. Uh, but let's let's jump over and uh, and check this out. So I'm going to go over to the, uh, go to Sweetwater again, because they're more likely to have it. Oops, I clicked my microphone link. But let's jump over to Sweetwater and take a look-see, shall we? Oh, there's my recommended mic, the AT2020. That's my recommended vocal mic, by the way, folks. Audio-Technica AT2020. Uh, so what is our friend Gortium looking at? The Tascam US 1X2HR. Let's see what this sucker does and what its specs look like. And if anyone's using one... Uh, uh, let our friend uh, know there. Oh, $119. That's a that's a compelling price. Uh, we've got headphones. We've got line out volume. That's cool. Uh, we've got a, a 48 volt phantom power USB. We've got the preamp there. And so it looks very similar to the UR12 that I that I also recommend, uh, which I don't have anymore because I uh, I donated that one because uh, paying it forward. Uh, but I've got the UR22 now. But the UR12 is a very similar layout to this. Let's flip it around. Yeah, very similar to the UR12. Does have, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's got um, the separate power supplies, which I love. So this means you can power it directly from a portable battery if you're using it with an iPad or an iPhone. That's always handy, as well as USB-C, which is kind of next level. That's kind of cool. Direct monitoring, which is handy. That means you can monitor either through your software or directly through the hardware. I like that. Uh, input select front and rear. Oh, what does input select front rear mean? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, that's cool. So it's got line input on the back. That's actually not bad. That's a pretty killer feature. So 
here's the problem. A lot of your single channel interfaces like this, I mean, it's two channel, but it's only a single preamp and a single line in. You can't use this for a stereo line input. You can only use this for, say, a microphone and a guitar or a single mono keyboard. If you had, say, a stereo keyboard that had uh, stereo output, you can't use an interface like this. But look what Tascam have done. They've stuck an RCA line input on the back. So it's only going to be unbalanced. So it won't be TRS. So you won't get a balanced signal, which means you might get a little bit of additional noise. But hey, that would be handy. So you flick this over to the rear, ding, and then you've got the ability to plug into the back and get line input. I kind of like that. Good, good job, Tascam. And then you've got line output. The line output is also only unbalanced, so you won't get pristine. So if you've got, say, uh, powered monitor speakers that have both a, a TRS and an RCA input, you'd have to use the RCA input. And you're only going to get unbalanced sound out. If you want to learn more about balanced and unbalanced, we can definitely go into that. I've got a video on the channel. Just search Pete John's balanced or Pete John's unbalanced, depending which way you want to go and what you think of me, and you'll find uh, that information there. But I actually like the design of this thing. Look at it. It like, sits up like that, like a, like a a, a, like a bit of an old school piece of gear and look at these sides yeah okay i'm okay with that all right let's here's the here's the the, the wrap though let's do that test that we said before to make sure that this is going to be 24 bit all right uh 192 yeah so look if it's 192 kilohertz it's almost definitely 24 bit uh, doesn't actually say which kind of goes against my thing it usually says 24 or 32 bit if it's got that on there but let's have a look here ah there you go uh, capturing audio in future resistant 24 bit 192 kilohertz uh, super low latency software bundle yeah this is a solid this is a solid interface i quite like this tascam send me one i'll, uh, I'll check it out <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it looks good. Uh, it actually looks very similar. If you have been following me in the past, you'll know that I, my first main sort of interface and one that I was in love with is this little sucker. And you'll see that this is pretty familiar, right? You've got the uh, the Yamaha D Pre over there on the left. You've got the high Z input there. The same sort of inputs and outputs. But the the difference here is that this one has that same dual input, but it uses an old school USB two input there, and uh, but you can still have the five volts, and it's only got line out so it doesn't have line input and again it's only got that unbalanced line output as well and it's a uh, it's that uh, old school german uh, tank like construction that's on the the, the ur12 uh, i wonder if uh, i wonder if the person i donated this to is still using it and if it's still going strong i bet you it is because these things are absolutely solid and you can see they're about the same price so i would probably uh, again same same bit rate so if you come down here so i just quick drink if you come down here, it will have Class A preamp, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's 192. Yeah, it is. 24 bit, 192. So exactly the same bit rate. So you're going to get the same sort of quality out of this uh, as you would out of that. And I uh, don't know about the preamps. I like the Yamaha D pre. Tascam usually have some pretty decent preamps on their stuff as well. So. Uh, I'm sure it would be good. All right. Uh, sorry, that was a bit of a a bit of a side jaunt, but I think it's important because I think a lot of you would be looking at upgrading your gear or maybe new gear or different gear. That's the main thing to think about. Make sure that you're future proofing yourself uh, and buying a 16-bit audio interface in 2022. Probably going to be a probably going to be a mistake. Nothing wrong with a bit of M and M. I only. <laughs> My wife made fun of me because on a live show recently, she said, um, oh, you do know that Eminem is called Eminem because it's Marshall Mathers. And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, hey, Pete. Yes, doing well. Got them. Oh, I got the headphones finally. And DistroKid. Oh, there you go. So you got the HD 280 Pros. These are fabulous headphones, um, by the way. And DistroKid. Yes, I'm, <laughs> look at that. I'm like a walking ad. Uh, Sennheiser HD 280 Pros, DistroKid. Use them. They're great. Hello, Lily Pillies. I hope you're doing well, folks. Uh, thanks to Manny over there at the Lily Pillies. All right, scrolling on down because, uh, yeah, he did change the game for rap music. He, it's kind of revolutionary. Uh, real question. What is your preferred iOS backup system for songs and presets if you have the time? So I'm I'm okay with backup. So, to be honest, I don't back up. I don't use a lot of presets. So I don't I don't spend a lot of time, you know, I'm not a synth guy, so I don't sculpt synth presets and patches and things like that. I use pretty much generic stock stuff a lot of the time. However, I do like to make sure that I have all of my actual songs backed up. So I'll very quickly run you through my backup setup for for that. Um, I'll just remove that from the stream. We'll add this one back in. So I'll just pop you off the screen there for a sec so you can see this. So 
my setup that I have here is everything is in uh, the iCloud drive. So because I've been using iOS for a long time, I've actually updated. I've got the two terabytes of iCloud storage. So you can, I've got, I think it's called iCloud Pro now. Or it's the iCloud, it's the Apple everything plan. I can't even remember what it's called. It's, it costs me about 50 a month and I get music, I get TV and I get all the iCloud storage. So for me, I've got four family members and between us, we've got something like 10 devices. It's kind of ridiculous. So all of our devices get backed up to iCloud, which is handy because if one goes for a swim, which has happened before, then it's all backed up to the cloud and gets backed up uh, all day, every day. So I store everything for GarageBand just in my GarageBand for iOS folder. But what you'll notice here is I use this sort of folder structure. And if we, uh, let's just sort it here. Uh, we'll sort it by name. So uh, I need to do a bit of organization here. January is organization month, by the way. I'm doing a bit more organization in January. So the Song Timber folder, this is just all of my drafts of my work in progress Song Timber song, which I need to uh, zip up and consolidate and put into my completed folder now. And then I've got ideas, I've got in progress, I've got completed, my background music, miscellaneous, which just gets weird stuff dumped in there. I've got my tutorial songs in here, which is everything I use here for the channel. Uh, I've got incomplete, so these are not quite done yet songs that I need to go back to at some stage. I've got archive versions. So this is where I've created versions and I've, I've had archive versions of songs that I don't really need to keep, but I'm keeping for a while in case I need them. Any collaborations that I've worked on over time. Uh, the Studio Live Today music, uh, which has nothing in it right now. <laughs> I think I've put everything in background music there uh, and my kids of what they've been doing. So that's what I recommend is a bit of organization here. And what I try to do, doesn't always work, is I try to name things. So I try to make sure that everything has a name and it's not just, so you got like ID Idea electronic loop, idea electronic loop three. So that if I come in here and I take a look and a listen at this one, we'll just download it there and we bring it up here, that I can go, oh, what was I playing here at this time? Yeah, and I can play that. So uh, that's the way I roll with my backups and uh, with iOS. And look, I know a lot of people will go, well, I don't want to spend the, the the extra 15 or $20 a month for iCloud drive storage. And I get it and I respect it. And uh, that's why I do also zip up these from time to time and uh, ship them out to my Google Drive and to Dropbox and to other places. And I have most of these stored on my old PC. I haven't done a backup for probably a year of everything to my PC. So I probably need to do that again. And that's just a matter of plugging in a USB drive, uh, zipping everything up and uh, copying it over. So hopefully that uh, that helps uh, explain some of what I do. But uh, yeah, interested again, as always, to hear everyone else and what you do and how you roll because there's different uh, there's different ways to do things. Canadian Club is rye. Thank you. Yes, I thought it was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> you got the bed sheets but you didn't get the whiskey. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, Tom. Jerry bought a new turntable. Very cool. Got new, new, oh, new socks and a portable wet dryer. I mean, don't underestimate... A good portable vacuum. I have a Dyson, uh, just a, a fairly cheap, like the low-end model Dyson, like the stick vacuum. Game changer. I haven't plugged in a vacuum in five years. I just put it on charge. It gets about half an hour worth of charge. And let's be honest, whoever wants to do more than um, half an hour's worth of, uh, of vacuuming. And it's just it's just cool. Uh, bed sheets for soundproofing. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> New MIDI keyboard for the Lily Pillies. There you go. Lily Pillies are going to get uh, even better. Uh, I bought myself uh, M1 based products for Christmas. Oh, really? The M1, the, the M1 Max, the M1 uh, iPads. What did you, what'd you go for, Dave Fox? Uh, yeah, can personally vouch for the for the Jade Star mastering for sure. I got a new lace death bucker for my. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, nice one. I'm like a lace death bucket. What? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, I pick up. <laughs> I'm assuming uh, after I master, I go listen in my car. Yeah, good, good question. Good, good point. Um, yes, yeah, doing the reference mixing, uh, reference listening. So once you do mix and you do master and you've got your song. Yeah, doing a listen on like a Bluetooth speaker, on the speaker of your iPhone, in the car, I just hit myself in the head, in the car, uh, on the home stereo, on the surround sound system, as many places as you can. And here's the thing, quick drink. Here's the rub. You're not going to get it sounding absolutely perfect on every device. But if it sounds absolutely atrocious on one and pristine on another, you might need to make some sacrifices. So sometimes you'll find that you've hyped the bass so much that it sounds amazing coming through your iPhone speaker, but it sounds like an absolute hot mess on anything that has any sort of subwoofer or any sort of bass sound. So you do need to pull that bass back. And it won't sound quite as amazing coming out of your iPhone speaker, but it'll sound a lot better for folks in, uh, in big headphones and, and speakers. So... There you go. Uh, question from Cora, Cara. Hello, Cara. Uh, can I practice guitar with an audio interface connected to an iPad? Can I practice while playing a song from the iOS player, audio player, or Spotify? Which audio interface would you recommend with low latency? 
Right. Uh, a lot of good questions there. Yes, yes, and yes. So you can you can use GarageBand or you can use something like Tonebridge to practice your guitar and play something on any other app using background audio. So I'll give you a quick example of this. And in terms of gear, uh, jump over to the gear guide here. My rec I've got a bunch of recommended uh, audio interfaces. We've talked about a few of them. The Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 is great. The Steinberg UI22C is great. And we haven't mentioned um, for iOS, for iPad and iPhone, uh, it is the... Uh, the iRig Pro, uh, the iRig Pro IO and the iRig, uh, iRig Duo IO. They're both really, really good. So all my recommendations are over at the gear guide, which you can check out. But to come back to your question, let's, uh, let's jump back over here and oh, we'll go to this one. I'll just pop your question down for a moment so that we can focus in on some of this stuff. Uh, so in terms of playing back, so let's just say that I was um, I was playing something on YouTube because you can use any any other any other device, but I'll just go to YouTube Music. Oh, I don't have YouTube Music on my iPad, or do I? Maybe it's is it installed? Yeah, it is. Okay, so I'm going to go to YouTube Music and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to search out. And I'll, I'll play my song. Why will I play my song? Because I'm not going to get copyright claimed. <laughs> So I'll play my song. Let's just say I wanted to play along or sing along to my song. We'll start start it playing here. Because we're all just a work in so that's playing in the background. I'm just going to turn the volume down so you can hear me as I talk. So that's playing in that app. Now, obviously, we can switch between other things and come over to here. Now, what we could do is uh, bring up a GarageBand project. So if we just go into iCloud Drive, GarageBand for iOS, just go to my Ideas folder and create a song. What we can do is just go to audio recorder here, and if we plug something in, I don't have anything plugged in at the moment, but if I plugged in a, a microphone or a guitar into my audio interface, I'd be able to hear this in the background while I'm actually hearing myself record or play guitar. And if I'm using headphones, I could actually record it in here without actually doing anything. And if you wanted to add, so say you want to play guitar and you wanted to add guitar effects, you can come in here to your plugins and EQ, and you can go and add something like, we'll get rid of the effect EQ. You can add something like Tone Bridge in here, uh, which is a cool guitar amp simulator. And you could throw Tone Bridge on here. And uh, yeah, you could play away. You could add your guitar tones and then play away along with your favorite songs in the background. Now, the key thing here, there's a setting here. So I'm just going to turn that off. <laughs> we don't need to hear my song the whole way through. There we go. Uh, so the the thing that you need to do is if you're using GarageBand or any other app, you need to enable background, run in background mode, which is here in the advanced settings. So to get to that, you go to your settings in your top right corner of GarageBand on your iPhone or iPad, tap on advanced, and then make sure that this option here, run in background, is on. If that's off, it means that whenever you switch, so say you were recording along here and you wanted to come over and change your song, it would actually shut down your GarageBand recording or your, your GarageBand playback if it was actually doing that at the same time. So make sure that you've got your GarageBand in background mode if you're using GarageBand, and then go away and record and, and play your song in the background, and you'll be good to go. But um, yeah, hopefully that helped you out. And then yeah, the audio interfaces, jump over to uh, the gear guide, because uh, we've, we've shown a couple of times already that I've got my complete gear guide over here, studiolivetoday.com slash gear, and there's a bunch of recommendations in there. The, the easiest way to get started, to be honest, if you look at my mobile setup here, is the iRig Pro, the iRig Pro Duo uh, audio interface, or you've got the single channel one as well. So uh, that is this one here. Currently unavailable. Uh, you can get it other places. You can get it at Sweetwater and other places. But this is just a really quick and easy and simple setup. Uh, we can just plug in guitar, microphone, all completely portable, all completely powered by your device, and it works well. But there's other uh, recommendations over there. As well, a question from Sean Rose. I received a MacBook Pro 2020 for Christmas, and I'm wondering how to easily export GarageBand tracks from my garage iPad to GarageBand on Mac. Ah, oh. yeah, I've uh, I've covered this, so uh, I won't go into detail here because GarageBand iOS to Mac because I've done a video on it quite recently, in fact. So if uh, if you search my name, if you search Pete Johns, and just as I've done here, go into your YouTube search, go Pete Johns GarageBand iOS to Mac. The very first one you'll get there is this. There's two, in fact. There's uh, this video that I did originally, and then this one's probably the, the more thorough guide. So it's a 15-minute guide, and it shows you how to get your GarageBand iOS project, how you can open it over into the Mac version, and then how you can uh, you can get it back into iOS as well. So you can actually do some pretty cool things. You can, once you send it from iOS to Mac, you can actually send it. I'll just bring this up for a minute and just show you. So down here in the... By the way, if you're ever watching something and you want to find more detail, if you go to the... Uh, how do I... How do I expand the, the, the description there? <laughs> That's weird. 
It won't let me expand that description. Bizarre. You can usually expand the description and see that, but you can see I've got timestamps along here. So I've got how to actually prepare your GarageBand iOS project, and then how to export it over to the Mac and open it in uh, in GarageBand on your Mac. And then I've got how to uh, go uh, add new tracks in iOS, and then you can actually bring it back into GarageBand, and those new tracks that you've added actually get added back into the GarageBand Mac project. It's it's like magic. It's actually really cool. So go and uh, go and check that out uh, over on the YouTube channel and uh, that should definitely help you out with that one, Sean. Uh, yeah, difference between mixing and mastering is is very big. Uh, so you do need to uh, do need to do that. Do need to make sure that you mix well and then master well. Yeah, if it passes the car test, it's ready to go. And look, do, do many people listen to music in the car anymore? I don't know, but maybe. Uh, g'day, Sion. Hello to you. Hey, Barry Smith. When am I going to use Logic Pro? I don't know. January. Watch this space. <laughs> Probably watch this space in January. Um, uh, d -d 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 Dr. Zorda said, finally got a field recorder to sample live. Lots of train sounds so far and, and Zorda's junior shouting obscenities. <laughs> I love it. Love it a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, shout out to folks who are, are unable to go places. We're not, uh, we're not completely uh, shut down here, but uh, it's, yeah. It, it's pretty it's pretty grim. I'm not going a lot of places. I'm spending a lot of time in my audio cave at the moment. Let's put it that way. Uh, hey, Peter. Season's greetings to you too, my friend. I hope you are. Hope you are well. Uh, oh, lock, are you talking about locked out in terms of locked out of your house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free to give some end of year love. If you're having some fun, uh, we are at, we're, we're going to be here about two hours today because uh, I've set aside a couple of hours. We've had some great questions. We've got time for a heap more questions if you've got more, so keep them on coming. And uh, I've got a few other sort of topics and things I'll be talking about based on some questions I got from other folks. So if we have time, we'll get to those as well. But yes, if you do want to hit the thumbs up and share, if you've got other folks who you think may have questions or may enjoy just uh, hanging out, then do that. Uh, question, Audible Video wanted me to explain how FM synthesis works on my show, but I was out of time. Can you do it for me? Uh, no, <laughs> because I don't know. You know how I can find out how FM synthesis works? I can go Wikipedia dot org and they'll ask me for money because they're doing that at the moment i have donated to them before they still keep asking me for money but it's okay uh, fm synthesis frequency modulation synthesis there you go uh, so what i would say about this uh from myself is that frequency modulation synthesis or fm synthesis is a form of sound synthesis whereby the frequency of a waveform is changed by modulating the frequency with a modulator the frequency of the oscillator is altered in accordance with the amplitude of the modulating signal i think we all knew that deep down but now you know for sure. So I'm just looking at the Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Wikipedia is your friend. It's not always right, <laughs> but it usually has kind of the right idea. Uh, thank you, Brad. Example for the uh, very fine, very kind super chat there, uh, as well as Adam Gehring. Uh, Brad Example says a little beer money for New Year's. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. And Adam Gehring, uh, sorry you will be inside more, but surely that means more uh, AAA content for us. Yeah. Exactly. More time in the uh, in the audio cave means more videos and more live streams like this one. So uh, very, very cool. And thank you to uh, Dave Fox for the super chat as well. Uh, the reason I'm not putting them on the screen, so I'll, I'll, when I get to them, you'll get a second shout out. Just because I'm about 10, 15 minutes behind in the chat, I'm going to catch up by the end of the show and then uh, I'll, uh, I'll pop them up when they come there because I don't want to miss any of the questions that have come in the meantime. Uh, Cara, we, we, I think we've answered your question, so thank you for that one, my friend. <laughs> uh, FM says this is mathematical. I'm sure it's mathematically very simple. Uh, which 24-bit vocal preamp would you recommend? Any any brands? So here's the thing. Uh, it's a good question around uh, vocal preamps. I don't use them and have kind of never used I don't think I've ever in the home studio used a standalone vocal preamp. Basically, because I found that as soon as I upgraded to a 24-bit preamp, so as soon as I got the uh, the Steinberg UR22, uh, 22C, the Steinberg UR12, and the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2, and I had a 24-bit 24 um, 24-bit preamp, it was actually fine. And I think that the problem is that the the preamps you can get, so the ones that a lot of folks um, go towards and say, hey, you should get one of these, and I've never bothered trying it, so I'm just jumping into Sweetwater via any means necessary here. The one is the um, is the Behringer. There's a Behringer preamp that is cheap and reasonably popular. I'll just see if I can find it here. Uh, it's this one. The uh, Behringer Mic 500 USB tube preamp, Mic Ultra Gain. Uh, I'm just not convinced that I'll get any better sound through this 
than I would just through the preamp in my audio interface. So this one, this one looks like it's actually a full USB interface now as well. Modern tech with vintage tone download. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if anyone has played around with this. And again, it doesn't even say that it's 24 bit. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, concerned by that. Anytime, it, remember, anytime it doesn't say 24 bit, it's probably 16 bit, which would be if it's, yeah. And look, it's only getting three and a half star reviews. So uh, I'll throw that out to the crowd because it's not my area of expertise. So to be honest, the, the Zoom has really nice preamps that I use for, for this and the uh, Steinberg UI22C and the iRig Pro Duo that I use, they all have good preamps and I've never bothered uh, dabbling in, uh, in preamps. Uh, what model is it again? Uh, which, which one? the sorry i'm not sure we, we talked about a bunch of stuff so i'm not sure the model of what um yeah ask again further down adam and i'll try to get there uh, i'm just going to turn the aircon on for a bit here because it's 34 degrees celsius here today and i'm kind of sweltering here so apologies we're going to have a bit of background noise for a moment uh question do you have a video that goes through both your ipad and iphone and desktop setups and workflow i'm new to the channel yeah so there's a bunch of them uh what i would suggest uh, so the the actual setups i've got um i've got my mobile setup and my desktop setups for the actual gear i've got my studio uh studio tour when did i last do a studio tour let's find it I'm pretty sure if I do Pete John's Studio Tour, it will give you the latest one. I need to do a fresh one for uh, 2022. But yeah, there it is. So uh, if you jump here, Home Studio Tour, what gear I use for audio and video. So that takes you through. Uh, and that's pretty much my current setup here. So it's my iPad Pro. Uh, I think this was... What, when was this? Did I have my Mac? This is a good question. I wonder if I was still on PC. Well, I was still on PC back in the day. There you go. This definitely needs an update. Because that's, but a lot of the gear is still the same. Uh, but yeah, so you see there the Zoom live track uh, that I use it was on the other side back in those days. Uh, but yeah, it, it does have all of that there. And then the other the other place to go is the gear guide there. So this is the more updated version. But yeah, you've, you've reminded me. The good thing about these shows is I get a whole bunch of uh, ideas about what I need to do new videos on. <laughs> because it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's always good to hear what people are asking about. Um, uh, ironically, I did end up with another less cheap Behringer and couldn't be happier. There you go. And you know what? Use what works for you. Uh, I, like I said, I used a 16-bit um, sixteen bit mixer, the Samson, for a really long time. Worked well. Hello, Peter. Question. I want some scratchy DJ, DJ turntable. Wiki, wiki. Sounds in my new song. That was me adding the wiki, wiki. The FX on GarageBand doesn't seem to work great. Apple loops aren't much help either. Any way to get some turntable sounds? I'm glad you asked. Uh, there is. So there's one Alchemy synth that actually has uh, turntable sounds in its background. Um, so vinyl. So again, I'll search my name. If you search Pete John's vinyl, you'll get this video here. So the vinyl record effect in GarageBand iOS. And I actually show how to use it. So it's the Dusty Record Synth. And what you do is you grab the Dusty Record Synth. Should we try and do it? Oh, I probably don't have time to do an example of it. But what you basically do, see how it, in this particular Alchemy Synth, it's actually got the, uh, the vinyl volume and the vinyl effects here. So what you basically do is you turn down the volume of the actual sound and you, eventually you're just playing the, the scratch sound, the vinyl scratch sound. So that's pretty cool. There is also, um, now what is the app from, uh, it's not from, who is it from? Clevgrand. There's also a Clevgrand app which uh, is called the following. I'm definitely not stalling while I try and remember what it's called and find it at all. It is called... Uh, LP something door LP. So Clev Ground have this one. If you want, if you want total flexibility, door LP is gold. So this has uh, a whole bunch of different settings here. You can change all the different sets of warble and amp noise and all the fun stuff here. So it is a paid app. So uh, you will have to pay a few dollars for it. So I would try the try the free technique first, Peter. And then if that doesn't work for you, come in here and play around with door LP from Clev Grand. It is uh, it is a very cool little app. Am I doing this on what? Oh no, cool. <laughs> I was thinking, am I doing this on one of my actual projects? I'm going to go, why did I add all these weird effects to this project? Uh, so yeah, Scratchy DJ, go for that for the win. Or the other thing is you could, can of course always go to freesound.org and download some, uh, some sounds from there. That's another option you have. Uh, sorry for the offensive comment I made a few days ago. That's fine. I, I don't get offended by much. I'm, uh, <laughs> I put myself out there, so I uh, takes, uh, takes all kind. But hey, if you made an offensive comment and you're back to say sorry for it, then that's cool. Good, good on you. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't hold grudges. To me, a garage is just a place to park your car. So that's a 
bit of a deep cut joke. Uh, question, made a new tune. I don't like the lead. Should I leave it and come back to it or scrap the whole thing for something else? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's turn the air cut off. Yeah. So um, you should do whatever feels right for you. I, I do both. Sometimes I force myself just to finish the song, just to have it done. And other times, like I did with my Down Under cover that I was doing uh, in GarageBand last year, or uh, sorry, this year, uh, last month. Um, yeah, I just abandoned it. I just left it there and let it go because uh, it wasn't working for me. My brain wasn't in the right space to create that song and it wasn't sounding the way it sounded in my head. So I've left it. I've put it in my incomplete folder. And I think that the key thing is to not just keep chipping away at it. Just go, I am parking this and I'm moving on to something else. So I did. I parked it and I moved on to working on other projects. So yeah, I think if, if it's causing you, you, you'll know yourself. If it's causing you pain, if it's causing you grief, if you're like, this just isn't working. I don't think scrap it. I don't think delete it. I like to just park things. And uh, I put them in a someday maybe pile. So someday maybe I'll come back to this. Some you do, some you don't. That's my advice on that anyway. Uh, Behringer is surprisingly good rugged gear. I have one of their compressors and some guitar pedals. Uh, yeah, and look, yeah, th they work and they're fine. Some of their stuff is not as good as other stuff. Some of it is. <laughs> uh, and a lot of it is is copied directly from some pretty good stuff. So there you go. Uh, the Jammer Man. So rare I can catch Pete John's live. Well, thank you for dropping on by. Uh, I hope uh, I hope you are well as well. Thank you for thank you for checking on in. A uh, question from Sean Rose. The virtual drama tracks change on GarageBand Mac when the time signature changes. They appear to adapt to 5.4, but not all. That's a good question. I must admit, Sean, I haven't used the virtual drummers on GarageBand Mac or on Logic much but I'm about to dive in. So others are probably going to uh, have better uh, answers on that one than I do. I know that the virtual drummers in GarageBand iOS do manage 3, 4, and 6, 8 time-ish, but they really are designed around 4, 4. And I don't know about 5, 4, but uh, yeah, if you're saying that the... Because I think 5, 4 is an option in GarageBand Mac. So if they if they do adapt to 5, 4, that would be super cool. Maybe I need to do a uh, a cover of some Dave Brubeck and uh, do some do some 5, 4 time stuff over there. Uh, not sure, sorry. Maybe uh, maybe ask over at the um, the GarageBand Facebook group as well. Uh, thank you to Dr. Zorders. Thank you to Dr. Zorders. Who says, Pete rocks, you all rock. And I couldn't agree more with the good doctor. And apologies, yeah, I'm, I'm still scrolling down, so I haven't caught up with where they are. But um, yeah. Oh, there you go. Justin Duke Project. It never occurred to me that Eminem is his initials. Yeah, me either. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not the only one that just went Eminem, Marshall Mathers, M and M. There you go. Uh, looking at the Tascam to use in conjunction with my Tascam DP24. Yeah, I think it, uh, look, I, I, I dig that. I like the whole using all the same gear. And I think if you've got a Tascam DP24 you're happy with, having that little Tascam interface, it looks like a quality product. And again, if you, especially if you've got a mixer, you could easily then use a the line out of the mixer into your audio interface. And then you can just plug that straight into a, an iPad or an iPhone or, or a PC or a Mac. And it would be pretty cool. Uh, cool. Uh, do, 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 do. So we've got some other options. Wobble is another one that Sion has uh, advised Peter for some uh, for some uh, scratch and goodness. And you still need a good dedicated record scratch AUV3 app. I can't. Yeah. So there really isn't like a proper scratch one. And it's weird because some of the first MP3 playback apps I used on iOS were like DJ turntable scratching apps, and they had it in there. You could like put load up two MP3s and actually like you could actually wiki wiki your way to uh, to freedom and to glory. It was great. <laughs> uh, hello, Ingo from uh, from Black Covers. I hope you are doing well, my friend. Thanks for dropping on. Bye, uh, Trevor Bear. Good day to you. Can you download your photos off of iCloud onto a disc? Uh, sort of. To be honest, the the way that iCloud stores files is a wee bit clunky. So you can copy them off onto uh, onto other platforms and onto disk. The best way and the most effective way I've found in the past is to zip up and then transfer as a big zip file and then unzip at the other end. Uh, just the way that Apple stores its files. It's the same with GarageBand project files and every other file. But the way that files are stored, it just doesn't seem to be super compatible. So... I haven't done a lot of it lately, to be honest, Tremor Bear, but if, if there's a lot of demand for it, because I do need to dive into it. I've, I've got an iPhone full of photos that I just don't know what to do with, and I kind of just want to say, back up all these and shove them somewhere so I can delete them and keep them safe, but I don't know. I, I think the easier way these days is to use like Google Photos or one of those sort of photo storage cloud systems, but someone else will probably have uh, other suggestions for you as well. 
Uh, the numbered folders is a good, yeah, so the numbered folders I use in my iCloud, if you missed that from before, uh, I use uh, here in, in iOS, I, I have my i my um, folders set up, but instead of just having folders, I have numbers, so I know that they're in order, so it's ideas, in progress, completed, they're sort of the three main pillars, and then I've got a whole bunch of other sort of subfolders with various little bits and pieces, but it just means that everything is a little bit more organized, and I can always come in here and, and sort by name, and it will always put them back into that order, rather than uh, have, I've, I've always used it, in all my Windows structures, I've always used um, numbers folders. It just it's it's a throwback from from back in my corporate days where you need to be able to find things like immediately. Uh, Dave Fox says I should be starting a stream to help you creative guys with the back end computer stuff. Very cool. I would dig that. Uh, there's not enough actual good quality tech support. That's why I do this holiday help desk stuff, and I'll probably do another one, um, another one in early New Year, uh, just because there's a lot of these questions floating around, and people don't often get the the chance to uh, to uh, to ask them, uh, and to have these sort of forums just to 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 shoot the schnizzle and uh, ask questions. Uh, by the way, if you're watching on the replay, don't worry, we love you just as much. I uh, hope you're enjoying it. Hit the thumbs up if you are. Uh, don't forget that we're brought to you by my patron. So if you want to become a patron, just go to studiolivetoday.com/slash/patron. Patreon. You can be like cool folks like Dave Fox and like a Mark and like others and uh, be a patron for as little as $1 per month and uh, appreciate all of my wonderful patrons for your wonderful support. Yeah, don't worry. I'm not as organized as I would like to be, but um, I, I'm getting there. Uh, let's uh, let's scroll on down and see if we've got any other questions. I've just got a. I'm going to have to. Uh, I know everyone's got some great uh, other comments and things and conversation going on, but I'm just looking uh, for the word question. Otherwise, we are not ever going to catch up with the chat. Because um, to give you an idea, I'm uh, 17 minutes behind the chat. I can see here. See, look, I just got to Brad Example's wonderful uh, super chat there. So I'm going to scroll on through here and just make sure that we're there. Thank you to Adam Gehring again. I told you, you folks, we'd get a second shout out. I appreciate you. Uh, two hours. I better get to start on the housework. I'm a dead man. <laughs> See ya, Craig. Thanks for dropping on by. Enjoy the vacuuming. Um, Dave Fox, uh, again, thank you for your kind donation. Do appreciate you. It is folks, uh, you know, I've got to do the joke. Georgie's not around, is she? No. Gotta do the joke. It is folks like uh, you and oh, by the way, a little ad for the Philips. Um, the Philips. What is this called? I can't remember. Automated light system. This has been a game changer because I can just do this and go. It's folks like Dave Fox who keep the lights on because without Dave Fox, we would look like this. But thanks to folks like Dave Fox and Brad Example, we can keep the lights on around here, and uh, we thank them for their contribution and Adam Gehring, uh, of course. So thank you, folks, for doing that. Uh, who agrees that we need an extended orchestra sound pack where we get individual samples for each part of the orchestra instead of combined ensemble and brass section? Yes, we do. Uh, you can go and check out the uh, the orchestra. What, what is the name of the um the pack? Uh, I'll show it real quick here. The, uh, the I symphonic. I I've, I've never do doven divened divened. I've never dived into I symphonic a lot, but it, it, it's good and it does have some good quality sounds, but. It, they also kind of nickel and dime you in terms of how you buy it. So I've only ever bought the base iSymphonic. I know um, Jade Stars looked at this in detail, and I know there's also the Swarm apps, which are probably doing things a little bit better now. Uh, but the things you get here in the, the iSymphonic app is that the first pack is like, you get all these strings and you get like the orchestra sounds and the staccato orchestra and the tremolo orchestra and you get like if you want and the like the brass sounds and the trombone section cello and woodwinds so there's some good sounds in here and they actually work well so we'll load in this trombone you can actually get some so there is some good stuff in there but to get everything, and like cello and woodwinds, to get everything and to have that individual instrument control, you need to buy like seven different packs and they're all about $30 each. And it's kind of the same with the Swarm instruments. It would be cool if GarageBand just sampled, like they did with the piano and the organ, just sample a bunch of high quality instruments and throw them. But you know what? You know what we pay for GarageBand? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we get it for free. So, uh, yeah, as much as I do agree with you, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to get that. But, yeah, timpanis especially. Like, how good would some bum, 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 bum timpanis be? I think so. Good stuff. And thank you, Genix YT, for dropping on by. I appreciate you. Uh, 
yeah, modern interfaces and mixers don't really need a preamp. I agree. I think the preamps were from a days where your 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 very early USB audio interfaces were just noisy, terrible pieces of crud. But uh, back in uh, but these days, most of them are pretty good. Uh, what's a good starter mixer that you recommend? Great question. So when it comes to mixers and starter mixers, the one that I used and therefore would recommend. Whoops, I'm I'm playing I'm playing my own video in the background here. That's a bit embarrassing. Uh, the one that I would recommend, if we come over to the gear guide, is, uh, scroll on down to the mixers section. So this is at studiolivetoday.com slash gear. And if we scroll down and we get to mixers, uh, it is this one. So I use this, the Zoom Live Track L8. This is what I use at the moment. Definitely not a starter mixer, more of a mid-range mixer. And as you can see, it's $450. So I know that's not within the budget of someone starting out, but... A really good quality, really useful, really uh, flexible mixer. If you're looking for something to start out with, I actually used this. And I still recommend this because it's pretty cool. So it's $180. It's the Samson Mix Pad. Uh, and it does all the same sort of things. It's got, uh, you know, it's got compressors on the first two channels there. You've got pre four mic preamps or four line inputs. You've got a whole bunch of other stereo line inputs here. You've got uh, the ability to do mix minus. You've got USB audio so that you can loop back your USB audio into your mixer if you're doing live streaming the like so i actually really dig that what a lot of folks use is the yamaha mg series so you really can't go wrong with any of the mg series the mg uh, 10 xu is probably one of the most popular ones so if you want to spend a little bit more coin for 220 clams you can grab the yamaha uh, mg 10 xu and you can see there it gets a lot of really good ratings same sort of thing you got four good quality yamaha d pre preamps on there they're really nice quiet preamps for your your microphones you've got a whole bunch of line inputs over here for trs so you can get some nice balanced input you've got unbalanced there as well for your rca you got the compressors on the first two channels you've got full control over your uh, EQ on all of those. You've got built-in effects, which are, eh, they're okay. They're usable at a pinch. And uh, yeah, you've got the ability to plug it in via USB as well. And as you can see there, there's the important bit about the Yamaha. 24-bit, 192 kilohertz. So I would probably go for this over and above the Samson because the Samson's only a 16-bit and this one's got your full 24-bit, 192 kilohertz USB interface. So I think that's kind of become the industry standard these days, the Yamaha MG. I haven't got one yet. I kind of want one. But because I have the Zoom Live Track, I don't really have a reason for it. So yeah. Uh, I haven't got one, but I hope that helps you out. Julian, thank you for uh, for dropping on by. Uh, James, does 24K Magic by Bruno Mars sound good with Auto-Tune, Vocoder, or TalkBox? Uh, I don't know. I don't actually know. <laughs> Not familiar with the song, sorry. So that might be one that I have to badunk, handball out to the community. If anyone has an answer to that, uh, then uh, help James out. But it's not a song I'm familiar with. And I don't I don't even know. I don't know what it uses. Uh, Auto-tune, vocoder, or talk box. Yeah, because they, they all sound kind of similar. They all do have similar kinds of sounds. Um, so sometimes it's hard to tell what it is between those three. I uh, just got an email about an interface called the Evo 8. It says, best interface of 2021. The Evos are pretty good. I haven't used one. Again, I'm going to say, cause here's the thing. Like, I, I don't use everything because I kind of can't. Like, I don't have the capacity to use everything or to buy everything or to try everything. But the Evo, uh, I believe, Mark, do you have the Evo? You have one of the Evo series? They are good. They look the goods uh, and they look like they've got uh, their very simple sort of setup. So this is the Evo 8 uh, from, uh, who makes this? Audient, yeah, sorry. Uh, Audient make really good high quality stuff. So here's the Evo 8. Very simple sort of setup there. You can see you just select your input, your plug-in. You've got four channels at the back there. You've also got your uh, your inputs and outputs there. And you've really just got a simple single dial approach there. So it's a little bit more like an iRig uh, sort of design. Uh, 200 bucks, pretty good deal. Yeah. For a four channel interface for 200 bucks and the quality of audience, pretty good. Maybe it is one. My goodness, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna be spending a lot of money buying all this stuff. So 24-bit, 96 kilohertz. Uh, yeah, got the, the JFET instrument inputs, the, the preamps in there, uh, professional performance and an entry-level price. It does look like it's got... And um, yeah, this is the one that has the smart gain function. In fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I reckon my mate... Uh, I think my mate Mike over at Creative Source reviewed one i could be making this up let me just check because i would trust i would trust mike with uh with good stuff so creative source evo 
Let's see if he has actually done that. Hey, he has. There you go. So Brad, I would jump over to Mike's channel and check it out because uh, he has actually reviewed the Evo 8 here. Look at it. Oh, see, he does all the B-roll, all the nice uh, high-quality B-roll shots that I never bother with. So uh, go and watch uh, Mike's review on that one, the Audient Evo 8. It looks like it's, uh, you're right. It looks like it's pretty cool. Uh, no, 34 degrees. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the uh, AC back on. There you go. Any, any donations, any further uh, Super Chat donations or PayPals or, or Patreons will be going towards my power bill <laughs> because 34 degrees equals a whole lot of uh, whole lot of air conditioning. All right. Uh, there you go. All the sounds in Ice Symphonic. So Jade's covered all of them. She's got the lot. She's collected the whole pack. Yeah, we're, we're to weather chat again. 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Can only, can only imagine. Can only imagine. Um, I'm just scrolling down. Yes, DG sound. DG sounds. Wicka, wicka, woo. Wicka, wee, 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 wee. Uh, Dave, a new uh, MacBook Pro and a new iPad Pro. Hooli dooly. Tremor Bear is going big time. Love it. Um, Darren Ramshaw uh, says, "Morning. I can't get. To, I can't seem to get GarageBand to recognize my guitar through USB to Lightning connector on my iPad Air. Playing it through a Fender Micro, all videos just seem to. Uh, they just seem to connect." Yeah, so I might need a little bit more info on that one, Darren. A couple, I would recommend, just because it's hard to to know exactly what your gear you're using, but the key things are that I found, and I've got a video on this one over at YouTube. So if you search Pete John's interface errors, this is the uh, the video that I would uh, point you to. And I use a very similar setup. So I'm, I'm using a Steinberg interface and I'm using a, an iPad Air 2, but it's kind of the same principle here. And the, the two things that I mentioned in that video, so just search for that one, Pete John's interface errors. The two things I mentioned are that uh, a lightning to USB 3 adapter, the genuine Apple one, is what you want to get. And number two is often it's a power source issue. So a portable, what is it? A powered USB hub is the other thing that I would recommend there. So if, you, if you're having problem, this is the same for anyone. If you're having problem with any of your USB gear, if you, again, if you go over to studiolivetoday.com slash gear and you check out my gear guide, under my mobile setup here, you'll notice that we have uh, a couple of things. We have the, where is it? <laughs> the 10, this one, the 10 deck powered USB hub. So this is what I recommend. Uh, I still recommend it. It's only 20 bucks and it's a four port uh, USB three charging uh, th USB three hub that s supports power and data pass through. And it just works. I've had mine here for what three, four years now and it works beautifully. So uh, uh, there's also a taller and there's a whole bunch of other people that make powered hubs. So get yourself a powered USB hub. And the other thing that you really do need if you come down here, I don't use it anymore because I use an iPad Pro with a uh, with a USB connection. But if you come down here to the master list and you go down to your USB adapters, you've got the, uh, sorry, here it is, the Lightning to USB 3 adapter. So if you're using one of the cheaper adapters, one of the ones you get from Amazon or eBay that are maybe 10 or 20 bucks, they just don't work. Uh, in my experience, they don't work, or if they do work, they work intermittently. And I know $39, or since you said good morning, you might be here in Australia with me, $65 is a lot of money to spend on a piece of plastic. But the good thing is you'll buy this once and you'll use it forever. And it'll be super reliable. It also has a port there so you can power up your device while you're connecting your guitar or your mic or whatever you're using via USB. So they're the two things, uh, Darren, that I have found personally is to make sure that you've got the genuine Apple Lightning to USB adapter and to make sure that you're, uh, you've are you got a powered USB hub to just make sure that you get some additional power if you're not getting enough through and you should be golden. Uh, thank, you to, uh, thank you to Sean Rose for the AC. <laughs> you can hear it in the background, I bet. Yeah, you can hear that beautiful, that beautiful air. I'll probably use about five quid worth of uh, worth of power in the next uh, half an hour. <laughs> Our electricity rates here are pretty, uh, pretty shocking. Uh, but thank you, I do appreciate it. Thank you very much for for that. Uh, oh no, it's done the it's done the thing where it's just uh, it's 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 flicked me right down to the bottom. Uh, oh, I'll just need to come back up and find where I was up to in the chat, and then we will continue on. There we are. There was Darren's question, so we're back on track. Uh, there's doctor's orders as well thank you very cool uh, appreciate your kind donation as well uh, question from jerry comb i see you have tons of effect apps but it seems you rarely use them and tend to stick to the few already available in garage band is it just simply a preference Yes, it is. It is. Uh, i'll have a quick drink because i need to hydrate and then i'll, I'll talk to this because um yeah 
So you're you're exactly right. Um, to the point now where, and I know this. I don't like saying this because people are like, oh, hoity toity Johns, he doesn't even have time for, for, for things that are free. But I do get offered a lot of different apps and a lot of different plugins to try out for free, which is an absolute blessing and I dig it. Um, but I don't have the time or the, the patience or the inclination to use it because I usually want to be creating songs. And what I've found personally, and people feel free to disagree with me on this, but when you're recording the sort of music I do, which is singer, songwriter, folksy, rocky kind of music, you don't need a whole lot in the way of fancy plugins and effects. You need a compressor, a reverb, a delay, and some EQ. And that's kind of about it. And I've found over time, and exactly as you mentioned there, that in my songs that I've created, so if we go into my old song, Goats Here, I used the standard guitar amp simulators here. I used a little bit of the, the regular compressor here. I use the, uh, the the echo and the reverb that are actually built in here into GarageBand. I don't have a whole lot of, uh, of fancy plugins that I use. Doesn't mean that you can't. Doesn't mean that it might not be better if I do. But I must admit, I've spent I spent the first couple of years. I, here's the here's the journey I went on here, Jerry. I spent the the start. So I need to turn that off. It's distracting me now. Goodbye. Uh, I spent the the my learning process using everything stock, and then I kind of went a bit nuts, and I went and used iSymphonic, and I used all these like fan these Ravenscroft, used all these fancy apps, and I realised that it was taking away from the actual core pro process that I had, which is I wanted to create, record, and release music. So I was spending a lot of time noodling around with all these different apps, not actually creating things. I was spending more time learning interfaces of different apps. Then what happened is, thankfully, Jade Star came along <laughs> and started doing how to app on iOS and covers all of the apps, which has meant that I don't have to <laughs> in the nicest possible way. And look, if there's apps occasionally that I think are really cool, like Mixbox and like Tonebridge and like uh, LRC, I'll still review them and I'll still use them. But more and more, I'm realizing that they're like, they're like the sprinkling on top. Like 90% of your production is, is basically just in whatever you're using. And then it's that 10% like nice sprinkles that you have on top that are the apps. So I don't know if that explained that very well, but that's kind of the journey I've been on. Does that mean that in a year's time, I won't be app central around here and I won't be using a whole bunch of wacky effects? Maybe I will. But uh, yeah, this stage... I haven't, uh, I haven't gone down that track. So hopefully that uh, answers. But a good question. And it's worth thinking about that as well. And uh, it's been a, a, a semi-conscious decision that I've made to do that. <laughs> Dave Fox didn't know it was Eminem 15 minutes ago, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, 15 minutes ago you learned. I was today years old. Is that what the kids are saying these days? I was today years old when I found that out. G'day, Derek Smith. I hope you are doing well, my friend. Uh, question, when going live with Facebook and Instagram, how do you create uh, R&B loops? Yeah, not sure. I, I don't go live on uh, Instagram a whole lot. I use I use Restream and StreamYard for my streaming to YouTube and to Facebook and to Twitch and to, to, to Twitter. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't do a whole lot in the way of R&B loops. Generally, my advice is if you're streaming live, a mixer is your friend. You can do it from uh, you can do it directly from from your devices. But having a mixer just really helps out because you can plug in all your stuff and you can plug in your gear. And it's usually easier if you're playing on one and then streaming on another. So if you say you're, you're mixing or you're, you're doing some beats or some loops or whatever you want to do, I'd do that on an iPad and then stream on an iPhone and send your audio out via a mixer into your iPhone. That's the way that a lot of folks do it. And that's the way that I found works the best. Uh, uh, when the super chats come in, spot the country could be a thing. Yeah. Well, I, I usually uh, I usually know where folks are from, or I can tell by the by the um, by the actual uh, denomination by the what is it the currency that they donate in. All right, we've got 30 minutes left, folks. We're going to catch up on this chat. <coughs> Question, I have an interface and a mixer and an iPad. How would I use the iPad apps as an insert effects and route the audio back out to the mixer? That was pretty much what I was talking about then. It's not easy. It does require a bit of gear. Um, the thing is, on a Mac or a PC, there's things like, uh, what is it called? Audio hijack. And there's things like the black hole... Um, audio sort of emulator that I know that Thomas Christ uses. So you can do a lot of sort of funky looping stuff. When it comes to iPad and iPhone, it's a little bit more challenging to work it out because the way iOS works is you can only have one audio out and one audio in at the same time. So even when you're plugging in your more fancy interfaces and mixers that might have multiple ins and outs, you're really stuck. So if I, if I show you an example here, so here I am on my iPad. If I scroll right from the top, uh, right and tap on this little one here you can see here that i've only got sort of three audio choices here at the moment the steinberg ui 22c is handling all the input and the output so that when i hit play up here it's hard to grow up. 
it's going to start playing there. Now, if I tap this to MacBook Pro or to the MacBook Pro Reflector 3, it's going to change the audio input and output to those sources. But there's not really a good way to get like a matrix where you can say, all right, so this app route this audio input or output to this and then do this to this. So what I tend to do is use a pretty basic, simple approach, which is you kind of need an, in, an interface or a mixer or something per device. And then it's as simple as just connecting one up and then using that into the other one. But it gets a little, like, it gets a bit tricky unless you're using something like I think Ableton has like Ableton Link and things like that. There's not a way that I know of or, or I've never explored the complexity of getting it to actually to, to be in uh, like to, to be more complex than that. So for instance, when I'm streaming here right now, I'm literally streaming using my Mac and I'm streaming out the the screen that you're seeing there using Reflector 4, which is the, uh, the the app that's running in the background. That means I can show my iPad screen and the audio is coming out of there. And if we bring camera two back into the stream here, uh, the audio is uh, coming out of there through my Steinberg UI22C and then around here into the mixer, into these two channels of my mixer. And then this is what's connected to my Mac and this is what's handling the stream that we're doing here. So I basically need two bits of gear. I need an audio interface for my iPad and an audio interface for my Mac. If I wanted to use my iPhone as well and bring this in as another audio source, I would have to have another audio interface or something on this so that that could have the input or the output depending which way I wanted to go. So yeah, look, it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, it's probably one of the areas where iOS needs to improve, which is the the routing of audio and the management of audio input and output because it wasn't really designed for what we do with it. USB audio was a bit of an afterthought. If you if you think right back, um, there was no desire or no design for this in the original iOS or the original iPhone or iPad design. It was designed to plug in and charge things and maybe a few accessories. It wasn't until we had the camera adapter and then people realized that using the camera adapter, you could not only connect a camera to your iPad or iPhone, you could connect USB microphones, USB audio interfaces and all this stuff. It all kind of got wedged in there. It was never designed from the start. So who knows, maybe iOS 16 will get better audio audio management and control, but I wouldn't be holding my breath at this stage. Yes, thank you. Feel free to come and join me on Patreon if you are so inclined. Philips Hue is what these are. Thank you, Mark. Yes, the Philips Hue, which uh, I, I dig. Uh, I find them super handy and convenient, except when the power goes out. <laughs> I'm sorry, when the Wi-Fi goes out, I can't turn my lights on and off. <laughs> 2022 problems. Well, 2021, 2022. Uh, I think uh, Universal Audio Apollo 2 is a game changer. I haven't, I haven't played with that. And I'll, I'll, look, I'll take that on notice. I haven't actually looked at it. But we're low on time, so uh, I'm, I'm going to keep scrolling on through. Uh, yes, but the UA do make very, uh, very high quality stuff. Uh, iSymphonic packs are costly, about $30, $30 each. Worth the money uh, if you want. Yeah, exactly. It, it all comes down to, um, uh, you know, investment versus return. If you really want some high quality symphony sounds, then iSymphonic is worth the investment. I don't use a whole lot. I, I throw the Hollywood strings on from time to time or occasionally use use a string patch or a, or a, a, a sort of a brass patch. I don't probably need it, but maybe in the future I will. So there you go. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello to everyone from everywhere around the world. I dig it. I dig it a lot. Uh, yes. Uh, if anyone isn't supporting Pete and Jade, one, one quid a month. Yeah. One quid, one euro, one dollar a month. Uh, I don't sort of promote it and, uh, and pimp it out too much, but it, I, I like it. I like it. It, it, it gives me a, a, another, let's, let's be honest. It gives me another source of income and, uh, it really does help when I get to the end of the month and like we are now and the Patreon payments come in, it might help cover some costs that we have around here. I have to pay for StreamYard that I use here. I pay $50, $59 per month just to use the professional StreamYard here. So every bit helps and it really does help me continue to uh, to bring this to bring this uh, show to you. So uh, thank you for all that you do. Uh, scrolling on down, uh, I have the Evo 8, uh, but Audient has been a bit shady in customer service. Ooh, that is not good. Is there a way, from Sean Rose, is there a way to print out the score sheet for my arrangements on Mac? I know, a lot of Mac questions. Yeah, and unfortunately, like, I'm still learning Mac, and I'm going to be super honest about that. I'm sure that there's probably a way to do it. You can definitely view the score on a Mac, and I would have to think that you can export that view somehow. I would think that someone like a Lewin Berenger over at GarageBand and Beyond or a Patrick Baird at, uh, at GarageBand Guide has to have covered that before. But let's, uh, let's do a quick search. GarageBand Mac Score Print. What if we do that? 
Uh, printing the using... There you go. We've got one from, I don't know what Expert Village Leaf is. Uh, but, 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 oh, score sharing solution. There you go. Quick tip from uh, the Garage Band Guide, Patrick there. How long is that? One minute 51. Should we watch it together? I'm sure Patrick won't mind. Um, I'll, I'll, give him, I'll give him a promotion. So uh, do go out and check out the Garage Band Guide. Uh, Patrick over at the Garage Band Guide is very, very cool. Uh, this one was from 2019, but I'm assuming it's still going to be relevant. Uh, let, let's just you and I have a quick, uh, quick watch together, shall we, and see what uh, Patrick has to say. Using GarageBand's software instrument tracks editor window, you can quickly switch between viewing your notes in MIDI formats or as musical notation. But did you know that you can also export, save, and even Ooh, print your tracks you notation as sheet music? In this quick tip, I'll show you how. Right. I won't show you that, but I will uh, I will let you go and find that quick tip and uh, view it. So it's quick tip seven, a GarageBand Mac. So just go GarageBand Mac score print and find that video from Patrick. And I'm sure he will share you the awesome knowledge and uh, drop knowledge bombs on your face. <laughs> uh, question, do a tutorial on how not record distorted vocals. Mm, how to not record distorted vocals. Hmm. Uh, I think I, I I have I've done a few similar ones to that Ingo, but um yeah I probably do need to do some more vocal recording because uh, I do get asked this probably more than anything, which is how do you get clean vocals? I did a video which is uh, this one here, uh, how to record clean audio in GarageBand iOS because a lot of people seem to struggle and much of it comes down in, in uh, assuming that you're talking about yeah you know, not as in not distortion the effect but not distorting your vocals not clipping your vocals and it is it is something that i see people doing again and again there's another one um i've done other videos around that but yeah it is probably time you're right it's probably time that i do another video about that because so many people they don't understand the relationship between input gain and output gain uh don't really know how to use a compressor effectively and yeah the, the worst thing that you can do is to record too loud a lot of people record too loud either they've come from the analog day where you had to record really loud to get a good signal through or they just turn it up and don't realize that they're much louder than they need to be they want these big waveforms because that looks good it's it's not um, so yeah, good, good suggestion. And we're back here to uh, We're finally down to Sean's, uh, air conditioning donation. So thank you. We're, we're, we're slowly catching up here. We're only, we're only 15 minutes behind. I'm going to keep scrolling through and I'm just looking for, uh, just looking for the word question because otherwise we, we're going to unfortunately be here, uh, too long. But we will uh, we'll get through as many more questions as we can. And if I don't get to your question, please leave a comment afterwards. Please uh, throw a comment down into the uh, into the chat down below, and we'll uh, into the comment section down below if you're watching on the replay. Uh, have have you mentioned why we need wired headphones instead of Bluetooth? No, but I did have this on my list. I did have this on my list of questions, and it might have been you that asked it. I'm just gonna have a quick drink. So, here's the quick version of this one. Because uh, a lot of people ask me about this. They're like, I've got Bluetooth headphones. Pete, I've, I've just invested. I've invested $400, $500 on a pair of Apple AirPod Max. And they're amazing. And now I want to use them for my mixing and mastering. Well, you can. But here's the thing. You're going to have latency. So Bluetooth is a technology, as you're probably aware. It's a wireless technology that allows audio and other things, uh, data, to be sent from one device to another. But it uses an awful lot of bandwidth. So you'd know this if you've used Bluetooth speakers or headphones before. There is latency, which means that there is a disconnect, a lack of sync between the audio and the video sometimes. So when you're playing audio and you're, you've got the video and then the audio, they're slightly out of sync. Now, if you're playing a video back, it'll just build in some delay to make them look like they're synced up. It'll basically do some processing and some buffering to do that. The problem is if you're recording audio, you can't have latency. You can't have that processing and buffering because it's all live and in real time. So for real time music applications, the even the small amount of latency you get from like Bluetooth 3.0 and some of the latest Bluetooth stuff is still going to be really annoying and frustrating. That is why using a wire is kind of what you have to do. Uh, look, will we get to wireless, completely wireless? Look, we already have them in the in the live stage environment because people say, well, yeah, why can't you use, you know, they use wireless guitar senders and they use wireless microphones and how is it different? Well, they're all using radio frequencies. They're like RF modulators and they're a lot more uh, expensive sort of infrastructure. Bluetooth is sort of very small, low range and uh, small, low frequency, I believe. Yeah, I'm out of my depths here, but... 
it's not the same. And until we get to the point where Bluetooth is as good as uh, as wired, yeah, I, don't, I just don't think it's worth it. You, you will get more frustration than you will benefit from playing around with it. It just has latency issues. Exactly. Bluetooth headphones have severe latency. And that's the, the bottom line. They're fine for listening, but not for recording. See, Tom has a way of saying exactly what I want to say, but in two very simple sentences. <laughs> rather than all the stuff that I do. Uh, how can I put 2-4 time in GarageBand without using 4-4? You can't. Uh, GarageBand only supports 4-4. It doesn't have 2-4. All you need to do is uh, use 2-4 and 4-4. So it just means that instead of having bar 1, 2, 3, 4, there'll be bar 1, 1 and a half, 2, 2 and a half, 3, 3 and a half. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. I apologize for that. Can't help it. What is the meaning of life? Weirdly enough, Jade, I asked a question. Um, yeah, it is 42, uh, which is also my age. Uh, I asked that question. We were playing, I was playing a trivia game with my wife yesterday. And it's like, now you need to ask, um, you need to ask one question at the start. And then you play this game. And if you win, you get your question answered. And I asked, what is the meaning of life? And of course, it's a very predictable question. And it said, uh, I can't remember exactly what it said. I should have actually written it down. But it was basically to, to, to get on and live your life and stop asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, which I kind of dug. I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, yes, it is 42, but you already knew that. 42. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for dropping on by. I appreciate you. Uh, welcome to the community. Good to have you here. And have I caught up? I think I've caught up. My goodness, I'm actually caught up with the uh, chat. So there you go. We've, uh, we've finally got there. <laughs> it took me uh, an hour and 40 minutes of the two hours to actually get caught up and uh, caught up on the chat. So uh, if you do have any final questions, we do have about 20 minutes left. I've got a few things I want to talk about, but final questions that you can throw in the chat here, question in front of it. If you're watching on the replay, don't worry. We love you just as much. You can leave your comments or questions down in the comments section, and I will circle back to them. I, I answered, um, I, I got my sort of year in review, and it said, uh, it said, all the different things and like videos and total number of videos and total number of views. And I looked at the comments and it was 19 and a half thousand comments that I've received. And I've responded to each one of them <laughs> because I respond at least once. I can't have long conversations in the comments because I can't go back and see what people have said. So I try to just make one definitive comment, but I have answered every single comment on every single video uh, in the last two years. So when I go into my YouTube, it says, yeah, there's an unanswered comment from like two years ago. So I missed a few back then that I haven't gone back to an answer, which, which would be a bit weird if I did. But um, yeah, I'm caught up on comments on all of those. Wow, just whacked my, uh, whacked camera too. Sorry, camera too. Uh, it'll be running out of batteries over there <laughs> on my poor phone. All right, uh, let's, uh, now there's one thing that I had a question and I had a question here with the reason I've got camera two set up here is that I did have a question from a supporter. His name's Rudy, uh, also goes by the name of R times two. And I'm just going to find my email from Rudy because he asked a specific question about, uh, about iMovie. And, uh, I just wanted to try and do some live solving of this one on the iMovie. Uh, buh, 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 buh. just bear with me a moment. Buh, 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 buh. Thank you, black covers. <laughs> the 420. It's four euros and 20 euro cents. That's what it is. Um, so he has, uh, so we've got, uh, so thanks for taking my question. I recently in November, 2020. So he, here's the problem. So Rudy actually grabbed, um, the magic keyboard for his iPad air fourth generation so let's let's go in here and we'll grab this we'll have the double the double setup here so he's got the magic keyboard as i have got move my water out of the way there as i've got here so magic keyboard here for the ipad and he said that when he's using iMovie he's getting this weird lag and latency so i said that why don't we we're doing the holiday help desk why don't we try and do some troubleshooting for him to find out exactly what's going on here so i'm going to follow along follow the bouncing ball with exactly what rudy said he was doing and what was going wrong with his so i'm just going to jump Jump out of this uh, this one, and we're going to go and create a new project. Let's go new project, new movie. So what does he say? Here's the breakdown. Uh, so here's what happens. I load photos or videos, nothing special. No crazy image quality tricks or anything, just straight up videos or pictures. I start scrolling through and lag starts to develop, especially when I want to speed to the end or the beginning. The functions on the keypad are useless after the lag start. Okay, I restart the app, not the iPad, reload the project, use my fingers, and it has no issues. So we're gonna we're gonna try this here now. So I'm gonna load in some videos here. I don't know what videos I actually have on this iPad Pro. Probably all screenshots and stuff. Look, I've got I've got some random videos of me from a year ago just talking and doing test things. So we'll uh, we'll select some of these. We'll add that one. We'll add that one. We'll add that one. 
So I'm just going to add in a few videos here. We'll add some of these screenshot videos. All right. And we'll create a movie. So that's six items, seven minutes. So we've got all these in here. So we're scrolling back and forth and it's working fine. So we're scrolling back and forth here on the screen and it's working fine. Why don't I, um, let's just convert this to a solo layout. You don't need to see my face. So I'm scrolling back and forth here and it's all working fine. And what Rudy's saying is that when he's scrolling, actually, I'm, I'm just, oh no, it does actually, there is a bit of, there is a bit of latency even just on the iPad at all. I'm, I'm very used to uh, LumaFusion, so maybe it's just that. But what he's saying is when you're scrolling here using the touch screen, that this gets even more latency. Which it definitely is. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. Yep. And it's basically ground to a halt. And it's it's like it's sending too many commands at once. And it's just, it's locked up. So you should be able to just keep scrolling left and right there. But it just completely locks up. So here's the good news, Rudy. It's not just you. And look, now I can't even do it on the screen. It's completely shat itself, as we'd say here in Australia. Oh. All right, so there, there it goes. It comes, it's almost like it's got a whole bunch of instructions in there that it's trying to process in the background that it's not able to do. And especially when you're doing it down here on the pad. See, look, there it is. It's back again. You can go left and right. But when you, when you try and move around, especially quickly, it kind of gets completely happened out. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not just you, Rudy. It is definitely uh, an issue that I'm experiencing here, especially with that. Like so on the screen here, it's not as bad. There is still a little bit of latency here, but I think it's because it's sending like multi-touch gestures to there. It's almost like the iPad. Look at it. It's getting way behind because I'll just do a bunch of left and rights there and then I'll leave it and it's still going. Like it's it's like processing it. It's like a stuttering to a, to, to a, to a halt. So, uh, yeah, look, my, I think there's a few people in the chat here have already mentioned, I know it's a paid app, but I would seriously consider investing in LumaFusion because LumaFusion is a fantastic app. And look at this sort of scrolling action. Look at the smoothness of this compared to what we were just doing there. Same sort of thing, same sort of video files, and you're just moving around seamlessly and you can zoom in and out and you get absolute precise control over everything with no problems. Let's just see if we get the same issue here with the, the trackpad. No, nah, look. That is, that is absolutely locked in. Zero latency, zero lag, zero delay. LumaFusion using the exact same hardware with a, just as a complex video here, probably more so because it's a screen recording. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's an iMovie thing, unfortunately. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's just an iMovie bug. And the weird thing is that Rudy mentioned that he, uh, <laughs> he's been through the ringer with this one. He's, um, I'll just exit the solo later. Uh, he, he's contacted Apple and, and Apple said, yeah, back up all your projects and reinstall it. And he's, I just think that no one's ever had this question. No one's ever used it enough and, and had this because it looks like it's just a general thing. I don't know if it's an iOS 15 thing. Maybe it wasn't as bad in previous iOSs, but um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think that, it, it is probably just a thing. Maybe it's a bug that they can identify and they can fix. But if you want to point Apple to this video and say, we tested it as well. And if anyone else out there wants to test it out, you can. But in all honesty, uh, iMovie is great for very small projects. But once you get into creating, I would move on from iMovie and pick up LumaFusion. It is a, not a cheap app. It's about $35, $40 or about $20, $25 if you get it on sale. But it's definitely, uh, it's definitely worth doing, uh, in my opinion. Uh, hello to Tony. Uh, what mixing desk or controller is that on screen? So that is, uh, we talked about it earlier in the show, but if you're just joining us, uh, that is the, the Zoom Live Track L8. So it is a, a mixer audio interface uh, standalone recorder. It does everything. Uh, it is my recommended go-to. I use it here on my Mac and it works beautifully. It's uh, got eight channels. Uh, I can have my iPad coming in on, on a stereo channel here. I've got my mic, I've got my guitar, I've got effects if i want them i can control my master faders here everything at my fingertips and uh, for if you're doing live streaming or podcasting or any sort of live work i highly recommend it if you jump over to studiolivetoday.com slash gear uh, you can check out that and all of the other gear that i recommend over there so uh there you go uh, i hope that helped you out Rudy, because it is a frustrating thing when you're doing something and uh look i don't apple tech support try their best but they're not using this stuff as much as we are, to be honest. So that's why I don't go to Apple for my tech support very often. I usually go to this community because folks are actually using things and experimenting things. And the other thing is, I'll just have a quick drink. The other thing to keep in mind is that 
this not that this stuff isn't designed for what we do, but we in this community generally we seem to push things to their absolute limits. So there are there are sort of some some things that we do that you're not your regular blue shirt at the Apple store has never seen before. Like very few people are editing iMovie videos in the way we are and uh, are bringing together audio and video and doing things with GarageBand and, and installing. It's why that if you go in if you go into an Apple store and you ask them, can I just plug in this USB audio interface and use it with this iPhone or iPad, they'll probably say no because they don't they don't support it basically. It's not that it can't, it's not that it doesn't work, but it's that they if they say yes and then something goes wrong, they will have a whole bunch of people in their store asking them questions and they don't want that. So we're kind of, <laughs> if you want to feel good about yourself, we're kind of above the the, the level of what a lot of the folks uh, at the Apple store know and that's that's just because we use it. We use it day in, day out and we specialize in audio and video stuff. Like people at the Mac store, uh, so people at the Apple store, they need to know about a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So, uh, yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Back from Doing Time. I hope you are doing well. Yeah, no problem at all. More, more than happy to, to to rehash if there's anything that you missed. I know that not everyone can sit here for all two hours and uh, and watch everything that we do. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's cool. Hello to Snow Dew over there on uh, <laughs> hanging out over on uh, Twitch. We are streaming to Twitch here as well. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here. Uh, what are we at? We've got 10 minutes left to go. Yes, thank you, Thomas Christ. There is the link to the gear guide. I hope you've had fun here today. These ones are always always really enjoyable for me. I always learn a lot. I always find out what I should be talking more about, what I should be talking less about. And uh, hopefully there's been some interesting tidbits of information. If all you learned today that Eminem is called Eminem because his name is Marshall Mathers and that's M and M, then uh, you've, you've won. You're ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we had some questions right at the start here from Paul Shackleton, who said, uh, struggling to get my Akai Professional APC Key 25 MIDI keyboard working with GarageBand. Hope you can help. Just doesn't recognize it. Well, the, the first thing I'll say is what I said earlier and my answer to everything. So if you have MIDI errors, no, hang on, MIDI errors. Yeah, so I've got a, a video here. Here's one I prepared earlier. I have this one here, which is MIDI keyboard errors. So this kind of goes through the same sort of thing that my video about uh, USB audio interface errors does. It talks about the common problems and I'll probably rant about things like a powered USB hub or like interfaces that you can use. Yep, look, I'm, I'm ranting about the fact that don't use the cheap little... Oh, oh, let's do some voiceover. What you gotta do is you don't use these cheap little dong dong gotta use your hands. You don't use these cheap little dongles because you get what you pay for. You need to buy a lightning to USB three adapter. These things are not good enough. They're just not right. Buy this one, it's big and chunky and costs lots of money. There you go. <laughs> What did I say? When I get into these last little bits of the uh, of the show, I get a bit weird. But um, yeah, what you want to do is make sure that you're using a genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter for your MIDI keyboard. And the other thing is power. So depending how your MIDI keyboard is powered up, it may need its own external power or it may get its power directly from your, uh, your USB device or, or you might need a powered USB hub. So they're, they're the two main things. But go and, go and watch that video and see how you go with that one, Paul, and get back to me if you're still having problems. The other question Paul had is, uh, how can I avoid nasty feedback when plugging in a microphone into an iPad and trying to record on GarageBand. Yeah. How do you do that? It all comes down to trying to avoid uh, feedback and a feedback loop. So there is a thing called uh, microphone bleed. So if I'm loading up in GarageBand, in fact, instead of talking about it, why don't I show you? Because that would be good. Do I have, uh, I might actually have, I'll just move camera two. I'll just move my camera out of the way. If I'm smart, which I'm not always, I may actually have a microphone right here. And I do, look at that. Within reach, microphone, XLR cable. So let's plug in a microphone and I'll show you, I'll show you what I'm talking about, shall I? We'll plug in, this is my AKG D5, again, over at uh, the GarageBand, not GarageBand, over at the Studio Gear Guide, at studiolivetoday.com slash gear. So I'm just plugging this in. In fact, I can bring camera two, even though I've just bumped him out of the way. I'll bring camera two back in here to show you what's going on. There you go. Oh, that's a bit of a dodgy view. There we go. Bring it in a bit closer. <laughs> so we've plugged in a microphone here to uh, to this one here, and uh, we'll load up GarageBand. So we've got iMovie uh, and LumaFusion going on over here. But if we go back to GarageBand over here, and we'll share the GarageBand screen in a moment. So um, I won't use Goats because that song is owned by a different part of me. But if I grab like Imagination that we were playing before, 
and I'll give you a bit of a run through here. So here, the, the main thing that we need to look at here, I'll just find the spot. Oh, that's right. We were we were soloing out things before. So unsolo those. So here's this song. How it is I got here and if I'm going under all the complications of my life. All the times when, when I couldn't reach the knife in my back to the days when I was a little kid. Always worry about... All right, so I'll, uh, I'll just mute these vocals. So when you're setting up to record vocals, here's the important stuff to do. So you're gonna create, we'll just duplicate this out. So we've got our vocal track here. You can put whatever plugins and effects and EQs you want on here and uh, whatever sort of uh, settings that you wanna use is fine. So we've got all this set up here. We've got our microphone plugged in. Now at the moment, we're not uh, monitoring. So I'm just gonna come back over here. I've got too much going through at the moment. I'll just come back to my, my single view. My, uh, my, my MBN starting to melt, <laughs> which is our, uh, our high-speed network here in Australia. So I just need to go back and have one source for a moment. Are you back? Are you good? Did you, did you, did you put the hamster back in the wheel out there? Thank you. All right, so we'll come back here. And we'll, we'll show this view again. So, um, so we've got our, our, our connection here. Now you can see when I'm singing into here, sometimes I sit around and wonder, I'm definitely clipping my audio. So I'm going to turn down on the input gain of this one. And this is what we we're talking about before with your whole not recording your audio too loud. Sometimes I sit around and wonder, that's better. That's where you want it to be. And if I turn on my monitoring here, check. Sometimes I sit around and wonder. Now, the key thing here is that I'm wearing headphones. So when I record this audio, it will pick up a little bit of what comes through the headphones, but not a lot. I'm gonna show you what I mean. I'm gonna turn it up to a volume that I normally wouldn't have the output and try and kind of get it closer to the headphone just so that you can hear what this will sound like. And then we'll record in and we'll do something. Oh, have we lost our audio? Have we lost our audio? Uh, let me know if we're, if we're back because uh, that could be a problem. I'll just come back to my original view here and we'll finish doing this. Uh, just If you can just get a confirm, if I can get a thumbs up if we're still live and we're still working because we did lose a little bit of our uh, our internet connectivity there for a moment. But um, if we could just have a, uh, uh, have a thumbs up to let me know that we're back and then uh, we'll be good to go um, before I do this because I don't want to do a, a big, long um, diatribe. We are good. All right. Cool. Excellent. Uh, thank you. So uh, we'll, come, we'll come back over here and uh, redo this. Thank you. Thank you, folks. This is why having a live audience like you folks is great. So we'll come in here and we've got everything set up here and we're ready to actually record. So I'm just going to hit the record button and uh, record in some vocals. Sometimes I sit around and wonder how it is I got here if I'm going under All the complications of my life All the time when I couldn't read the knife in my back to the days when I was a little kid Always worry about the things I never did Always think about the next big problem Even when it's someone else's solver Hook me in, line and sinker Ever wonder what it's like to be an overthinker Tinker with all my little thoughts Maybe it was just the way that I was taught You just believe that I was right And when I lay in bed at night the thought's still going round and round and round and round in my head. Right. So the reason that I kind of moved the microphone around there a little bit is to show you what mic bleed is all about here. So when we started up here, we're going to solo this track and I'm going to be brave here and play you just my vocals here. So let's play the bit here at the start where there's nothing playing. Oh, horrible mouth noises. Sometimes I sit around and wonder how it is I got here and if I'm going under all the complications of my life all the time when I couldn't reach a knife in my back to the days when I was a little kid always worry can you hear just in between there that there's a little bit of the sound leaking through? Now, in a moment, I take it and I try and put it closer to my headphones so that you can hear a bit more of it. I worry about the things I never did. Or I think about the next big problem, even when it's someone else that's on the hook me in, line and sinker. Ever wonder what it's like? So I actually did an okay job. I was hoping that uh, I was hoping that it would actually pick up more. But the thing is, when you are getting that uh, that feedback sound, it means that you're getting the audio you're playing back into the microphone as well as what you're trying to put into the microphone. Now, if you're not using headphones, that's a big problem because if this was instead of coming through my headphones, and this is that's probably a great advertisement for the Sennheiser HD two eighty Pros because 
there was virtually no bleed into the microphone, even when I was trying to get it up and put it up closer to there because I'm using a dynamic mic, which picks up very directional and I'm using very nice closed back headphones that don't let a lot of sound out. So good quality headphones, make sure that you're using them and uh, don't ever use the speaker on your iPad or your iPhone when you're recording vocals and you should be good to go. Yeah, a bit of, bit of early 90s rap. You're speaking of Eminem, we're a little bit Eminem-y there. Uh, was there a question from Martin? Did you have? I uh, couldn't find it. I think we answered that. Or, or other folks may have already answered it. Uh, but yeah, if anyone does have any final questions, we are. Uh, oh, yeah, so the latency thing. Yeah, Bluetooth. Yeah, so try to use wired. And again, if I, the, the problem was if I was using Bluetooth headphones instead of these when I was recording just then, there would be a delay between when I was hearing and then when I was singing. So everything would sound slightly delayed, slightly out of sync. And as we talked about, a good sort of way to wrap it all up. As we talked about right back at the start, you want to be able to make sure that you're in the pocket, in the zone, right on the beat so that you got your best quality sound coming through. I'm just going to undo that vocal recording that I just did there. Otherwise, I'm going to get super confused as to why it's there. <laughs> Be like, why did, I, why did I have this track? Oh, mate. All right, we are, we are good. Um, just like Eminem, not a fan. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not a fan anymore. Um, these days, it was weird. I, I, I never liked his violent stuff. I just thought that he uh, was a decent... Uh, decent, he created decent songs um, in terms of the musicality. Didn't agree with any of his topics, virtually any of his topics and any of his, uh, any of his, yeah, content. But uh, especially these days, because I'm super not, I can't even play Grand Theft Auto anymore. I've, I've gone super soft and non-violent in my old age, but it's okay. All right, uh, we're talk talking about Smarties and M&Ms. I'm getting hungry, nearly lunchtime. All right, I'm going to go and have some lunch. But thank you, everyone, for being here. I uh, really do appreciate all of the support that you folks have given throughout the year. Uh, we will be back live in just two days' time for your Music Live. That is our next live show that is happening uh, Friday morning here in Australia. It's going to be Thursday afternoon or evening, depending where you are in the world. Uh, hello, Amelia, by the way. I saw you drop on in there. I don't think I said good day, uh, Mrs. Christ. Um, so, yeah, we will be back in two days time for your music live that should be a lot of fun a lot of more cool music from the community if you do want to share your music or you do want to submit a song studiolivetoday.com slash yml is the place to go and as soon as i hit the end button on this one it'll dump you straight over there so you can set yourself a reminder and tune on in again for that next show uh final question from tony i've got the sennheiser hd 300 pro do you rate them yes i use the 280 pro i rate sennheiser sennheiser for the absolute win thank Thanks everyone for being here. Please, as we say at the end of every show, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, keep creating, and I'll see you real soon. Bye for now.